Dedication of the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Dedication. To the Right Honourable and Noblest Lord Richard, Earl of Carberry, etc., etc. My Lord, I am treating your Lordship as a Roman gentleman did St. Augustine and his mother. I shall entertain you in a charnel house, and carry your meditations a while into the chambers of death, where you shall find the rooms dressed up with melancholic arts, and fit to converse with your most retired thoughts, which begin with a sigh, and proceed in deep consideration, and end in a holy resolution. The sight that St. Augustine most noted in that house of sorrow was the body of Caesar, clothed with all the dishonors of corruption that you can suppose in a six months burial. But I know that, without pointing, your first thoughts will remember the change of a greater beauty, which is now dressing for the brightest immortality, and from her bed of darkness calls to you to dress your soul for that change which shall mingle your bones with that beloved dust, and carry your soul to the same choir, where you may both sit and sing for ever. My lord, it is your dear lady's anniversary and she deserved the biggest honor and the longest memory and the fairest monument and the most solemn mourning and in order to it give me leave my lord to cover her hearse with these following sheets this book was intended first to minister to her piety and she desired all good people should partake of the advantages which are here recorded she knew how to live rarely well and she desired to know how to die and god taught her by an experiment but since her work is done, and God supplied her with the provisions of his own, before I could minister to her, and perfect what she desired, it is necessary to present your lordship those bundles of cypress which were intended to dress her closet, but come now to dress her hearse. My lord, both your lordship and myself have lately seen and felt such sorrows of death, and such sad departure of dearest friends that it is more than high time we should think ourselves nearly concerned in the accidents death hath come so near to you as to fetch a portion from your very heart and now you cannot choose but dig your own grave and place your coffin in your eye when the angel hath dressed your scene of sorrow and meditation with so particular and so near an object and therefore as it is my duty i am come to minister to your pious thoughts and to direct your sorrows that they may turn into virtues and advantages and since i know your lordship to be so constant and regular in your devotion and so tender in the matter of justice so ready in the expressions of charity and so apprehensive of religion that you are a person whose work of grace is apt and must every day grow toward those degrees where when you arrive you shall triumph over imperfection and choosing nothing but what may please god i could not by any compendium conduct and assist your pious purposes so well as by that which is the great argument and the great instrument of holy living the consideration and exercises of death my lord it is a great art to die well and to be learnt by men in health by them that can discourse and consider by those whose understanding and active reason are not abated with fear or pains and as the greatest part of death is passed by the preceding years of our life so also in those years are the greatest preparations to it and he that prepares not for death before his last sickness is like him that begins to study philosophy when he is going to dispute publicly in the faculty all that a sick and dying man can do is but to exercise those virtues which he before acquired and to perfect that repentance which was begun more early and of this my lord my book i think is a good testimony not only because it represents the vanity of a late and sick-bed repentance but because it contains in it so many precepts and meditations so many propositions and various duties such forms of exercise and the degrees and difficulties of so many graces which are necessary preparatives to a holy death that the very learning the duties requires study and skill time and understanding in the ways of godliness and it were very vain to say so much is necessary and not to suppose more amazed timorous and weak person whose senses are weak whose discerning faculties are lessened 
whose principles are main intricate and entangles upon whose eye sits a cloud and the heart is broken with sickness and the liver pierced through with sorrows and the strokes of death and therefore my lord it is intended by the necessity of affairs that the pre-health and the days of discourse and understanding which in this case hath another degree of necessity superadded because another notices an imperfect study may be supplied by a frequent exercise and renewed experience her if we practice imperfectly once we shall never recover the error for we die but once and therefore it will be necessary that our skill be more exact since it is not to be mended by trial but the actions must be for ever left imperfect unless the habit contracted with study and contemplation beforehand and indeed i were vain if i should intend this book to be read and studied by dying persons and they were vainer that should need to be instructed in those graces which they are then to exercise and to finish for a sick bed is only a school of severe exercise in which the spirit of a man is tried and his graces are rehearsed and the assistances which i have in the following pages given to those virtues which are proper to the state of sickness are such as suppose a man in the state of grace or they confirm a good man or they support the weak or add degrees or minister comfort or prevent an evil or cure the little mischiefs which are incident to tempted persons in their weakness that is the sum of the present design as it relates to dying persons and therefore i have not inserted any advices proper to old age but such as are common to it in the state of sickness for i suppose very old age to be a longer sickness it is a labor and sorrow when it goes beyond the common period of nature but if it be on this side that period and be helpful in the same degree it is so i reckon it in the accounts of life and therefore it can have no distinct consideration but i do not think it is a station of advantage to begin the change of an evil life it is a middle state between life and deathbed and therefore although it hath more of hopes than this and less than that yet as it partakes of either state so it is to be regulated by the advices of that state and judged by its sentences only this i desire that all old persons would sadly consider that their advantages in that state are very few their bodies are without strength their prejudices long and mighty their vices if they have lived wicked are habitual the occasions of the virtues not many the possibilities of some in the matter of which they stand very guilty are past and shall never return again such are chastity in many parts of self-denial that they have some temptations proper to their age as peevishness and pride covetousness and talking wilfulness and unwillingness to learn and they think they are protected by age from learning anew or repenting the old and do not leave but change their vices and after all this either the day of their repentance is past as we see it true in very many or it is expiring and towards the sunset as it is in all and therefore although in these to recover is very possible yet we may also remember that in the matter of virtue and repentance possibility is a great way off from performance and how few do repent of whom it is only possible that they may and that many things more are required to reduce their possibility to act a great grace an assiduous ministry an effective calling mighty assistances excellent counsel great industry a watchful diligence a well-disposed mind passionate desires deep apprehensions of danger quick perceptions of duty and time and god's good blessing and effectual impression and seconding all this that to will and do may by him be wrought to great purposes and with great speed and therefore it will not be amiss but it is hugely necessary that these persons who have lost their time and their blessed opportunities should have the diligence of youth and the zeal of new converts and take account of every hour that is left them and pray perpetually and be advised prudently and study the interests of their souls carefully with diligence and with fear and their old age which in effect is nothing but a continual deathbed dressed with some more order and advantages may be a state of hope and labor and acceptance through the infinite mercies of god in jesus christ but concerning sinners really under the arrest of death god hath made no deathbed covenant 
the scriptures hath recorded no promises given no instructions and therefore i had none to give but only the same which are to be given to all men that are alive because they are so and because it is uncertain when they shall be otherwise but then this advice i also am to insert that they are the smallest number of christian men who can be divided by the characters of a certain holiness or an open villainy and between these there are many degrees of latitude and most are of a middle sort concerning which we are tied to make the judgments of charity and possibly god may do too but however all they are such to whom the rules of holy dying are useful and applicable and therefore no separation is to be made in this world but where the case is not evident men are to be permitted to the unerring judgment of god where it is evident we can rejoice or mourn for them that die in the church of rome they reckon otherwise concerning sick and dying christians than i have done for they make profession that from death to life from sin to grace a man may very certainly be changed though the operation begin not before his last hour and half this they do upon his deathbed and the other half when he is in his grave and they take away the eternal punishment in an instant by a school distinction or the hand of the priest and the temporal punishment shall stick longer even then when the man is no more measured with time having nothing to do with anything of or under the sun but that they pretend to take away too when the man is dead and god knows the poor man for all this pays them both in hell the distinction of temporal and eternal is a just measure of pain when it refers to this life and another but to dream of a punishment temporal when all his time is done and to think of repentance when the time of grace is past are great errors the one in philosophy and both in divinity and are a huge folly in their pretense and infinite danger if they are believed being a certain destruction of the necessity of holy living when men dare trust them and live at the rate of such doctrines the secret of these is soon discovered for by such means the holy life be not necessary yet a priest is as if god did not appoint the priest to minister to holy living but to excuse it so making the holy calling not only to live upon the sins of the people but upon their ruin and the advantages of their function to spring from their eternal dangers it is an evil craft to serve a temporal end upon the death of souls that is an interest not to be handled but with nobleness and ingenuity fear and caution diligence and prudence with great skill and great honesty with reverence and trembling and severity a soul is worth all that and the need we have requires all that and therefore those doctrines that go less than all this are not friendly because they are not safe i know no other difference in the visitation and treating of sick persons than what depends upon the article of late repentance for all churches agree in the same essential propositions and assist the sick by the same internal ministries as for external i mean unction used in the church of rome since it is used when the man is above half dead when he can exercise no act of understanding it must needs be nothing for no rational man can think that any ceremony can make a spiritual change without a spiritual act of him that is to be changed nor work by way of nature or by charm but morally and after the manner of reasonable creatures and therefore i do not think that ministry at all fit to be reckoned among the advantages of sick persons the fathers of the council of trent first disputed and after this manner at last agreed that extreme unction was instituted by christ but afterwards being admonished by one of their theologues that the apostles ministered unction to inform people before they were priests the priestly order according to their doctrine being collated in the institution of the last supper for fear that it should be taught that this unction might be administered by him that was no priest they blotted out the word instituted and put in its stead insinuated this sacrament and that it was published by st james so it is in their doctrine and yet in their anathematisms they curse all them that shall deny it to have been instituted by christ i shall lay no more prejudice against it or the weak arts of them that maintain it but add this only that there being but two places of scripture pretended for this ceremony some chief men of their own side have proclaimed these two invalid as to the institution of it for suarez says that the unction used by the apostles in st mark six thirteen is not the same with what is used in the church of rome and that it cannot be plainly gathered from the epistle of st james cajetan affirms that it did belong to the miraculous gift of healing 
not to a sacrament the sick man's exercise of grace formerly acquired his perfecting repentance began in the days of health the prayers and counsels of the holy man that ministers the giving the holy sacrament the ministry and assistance of angels and the more mercies of god the peace of conscience and the peace of the church are all the assistances and preparatives that can help to dress his lamp but if a man shall go to buy oil when the bridegroom comes if his lamp be not first furnished and then trimmed that in this life this upon his deathbed his station will be without doors his portion with unbelievers and the unction of the dying man shall no more strengthen his soul than it cures his body and the prayers for him after his death shall be of the same force as if they should pray that he should return to life again the next day and live as long as lazarus in his return but i consider that it is not well that men should pretend anything will do a man good when he dies and yet the same ministries and ten times more assistances are found for forty or fifty years together to be ineffectual can extreme unction at last cure what the holy sacrament of the eucharist all his lifetime could not do can prayers for a dead man do him more good than when he was alive if all his days the man belonged to death and the dominion of sin and from thence could not be recovered by sermons and counsels and perpetual precepts and frequent sacraments by confessions and absolutions by prayers and advocations by external ministries and internal acts it is but too certain that his lamp cannot then be furnished his extreme unction is only then of use when it is made by the oil that burned in his lamp in all the days of his expectation and waiting for the coming of the bridegroom neither can any supply be made in this case by their practice of praying for the dead though they pretend for this the fairest precedence of the church and of the whole world the heathens they say did it and the jews did it and the christians did it some were baptized for the dead in the days of the apostles and very many were communicated for the dead for so many ages after it is true they were so and did so the heathens prayed for an easy grave and a perpetual spring that saffron would rise from their beds of grass the jews prayed that the souls of their dead might be in the garden of eden that they might have their part in paradise and in the world to come and that they might hear the peace of the fathers of their generation sleeping in hebron and the christians prayed for a joyful resurrection for mercy at the day of judgment for hastening of the coming christ and the kingdom of god and they named all sorts of persons in their prayers all i mean but wicked persons all but them that lived evil lives they named apostles saints and martyrs and all this is so nothing to their purpose or so much against it that the prayers for the dead used in the church of rome are most plainly condemned because they are against the doctrine and practices of all the world in other forms to other purposes relying upon distinct doctrines until new opinions began to arise about st augustine's time and changed the face of the proposition concernment from the lord and therefore concerning it we can have no rules nor proportions but from those imperfect revelations of the state of departed souls and the measures of charity which can relate only to the imperfection of their present condition and the terrors of the day of judgment but to think that any supplatory to an evil life can be taken from such devotions after the sinners are dead may encourage a bad man to sin but cannot relieve him when he hath but of all the things in the world methinks men should be most careful not to abuse dying people not only because their condition is pitiable but because they shall soon be discovered and in the secret regions of souls there shall be an evil report concerning those men who have deceived them and if we believe we shall go to that place where such reports are made we may fear the shame and the amazement of being accounted impostors in the presence of angels and all the wise holy men of the world to be erring and innocent is hugely pitiable and incident to mortality that we cannot help but to deceive or to destroy so great an interest as is that of a soul or to lessen its advantages by giving it trifling and false confidences is injurious and intolerable and therefore it were very well if all the churches of the world would be extremely curious concerning their offices and ministries of the visitation of the sick that their ministers they send be holy and prudent that their instructions be severe and safe that their sentences be merciful and reasonable that their offices be sufficient and devout 
that their attendances be frequent and long that their deputations be special and peculiar that the doctrines upon which they ground their offices be true material and holy that their ceremonies be few and their advices wary that their separation be full of caution their judgments not remiss their remissions not loose and dissolute and that all the whole ministration be made by persons of experience and charity for it is a sad thing to see our dead go out of our hands they live incuriously and die without regard and the last scene of their life which should be dressed with all spiritual advantages is abused by flattery and easy propositions and let go with carelessness and folly my lord i have endeavored to cure some part of the evil as well as i could being willing to relieve the needs of indigent people in such ways as i can and therefore have described the duties which every sick man may do alone with such in which he can be assisted by the minister and am more the confident that these my endeavors will be the better entertained because they are the first entire body of directions for sick and dying people that i remember to have been published in the church of england in the church of rome there have been many but they are dressed with such doctrines which are sometimes useless sometimes hurtful and their whole design of assistance which they commonly yield is at the best imperfect and the resentment is too careless and too loose for so severe an employment so that in this affair i was almost forced to walk alone only that i drew the rules and advices from the fountains of scripture and the purest canicla of the primitive church and was helped by some experience in the cure of souls i shall measure the success of my labors not by popular noises or the sentences of curious persons but by the advantage which good people may receive my work here is not to please the speculative part of men but to minister to practice to preach to the weary to comfort the sick to assist the penitent to reprove the confident to strengthen weak hands and feeble knees having scarce any other possibilities left me of doing alms or exercising that charity by which we shall be judged at doomsday it is enough for me to be an underbuilder in the house of god and i glory in the employment i labor in the foundations and therefore the work needs no apology for being plain so be it strong and well laid but my lord as mean as it is i must give god thanks for the desires and the strength and next to him to you for that opportunity and little portion of leisure which i had to do it in for i must acknowledge it publicly and besides my prayers it is all the recompense i can make you my being quiet i owe to your interest much of my support to your bounty and many other collateral comforts i derive from your favor and nobleness my lord because i much honor you and because i would do honor to myself i have written your name in the entrance of my book i am sure you will entertain it because the design related to your dear lady and because it may minister to your spirit in the day of visitation when god shall call for you to receive your reward for your charity and your noble piety by which you have not only endeared very many persons but in great degrees have obliged me to be my noblest lord your lordship's most thankful and most humble servant jeremy taylor End of Dedication Section 1 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor Chapter 1. A General Preparation Towards a Holy and Blessed Death, by Way of Consideration. Section 1. Consideration of the Vanity and Shortness of Man's Life. A man is a bubble, said the Greek proverb, which Lucian represents with advantages and its proper circumstances to this purpose, saying that all the world is a storm, and men rise up in their several generations, like bubbles descending, o jovo pluvio, from God and the dew of heaven, from a tear and drop of rain, from nature and providence. And some of these instantly sink into the deluge of their first parent, and are hidden in a sheet of water, having had no other business in the world but to be born, 
that they might be able to die. Others float up and down two or three turns, and suddenly disappear, and give their places to others. And they that live longest upon the face of the waters are in perpetual motion, restless and uneasy, and, being crushed with a great drop of a cloud, sink into flatness and a froth. The change not being great, it being hardly possible it should be more a nothing than it was before. So is every man. He is born in vanity and sin. He comes into the world like morning mushrooms, soon thrusting up their heads into the air and conversing with their kindred of the same production, and as soon they turn into dust and forgetfulness, some of them without any other interest in the affairs of the world, but that they made their parents a little glad and a little sorrowful. Others ride longer in the storm. It may be until seven years of vanity be expired, and then peradventure the sun shines hot upon their heads, and they fall into the shades below, into the cover of death and darkness of the grave to hide them. But if the bubble stands the shock of a bigger drop, and outlives the chances of a child, of a careless nurse, of drowning in a pail of water, of being overlaid by a sleepy servant, or such little accidents, then the young man dances like a bubble, empty and gay, and shines like a dove's neck, or the image of a rainbow which hath no substance, and whose very imagery and colors are fantastical. And so he dances out the gaiety of his youth, and is all the while in a storm, and endures only because he is not knocked on the head by a drop of bigger rain, or crushed by the pressure of a load of indigested meat, or quenched by the disorder of an ill-placed humor, and to preserve a man alive in the midst of so many chances and hostilities is as great a miracle as to create him. To preserve him from rushing into nothing, and at first to draw him up from nothing, were equally the issues of an almighty power. And therefore the wise men of the world have contended who shall best fit man's condition with words signifying his vanity and short abode. Honor calls a man a leaf the smallest, the weakest piece of a short-lived, unsteady plant. Pinder calls him the dream of a shadow, another the dream of the shadow of smoke. But St. James spake by a more excellent spirit, saying, Our life is but a vapor, viz., drawn from the earth by a celestial influence, made of smoke, or the lighter parts of water tossed with every wind, moved by the motion of a superior body, without virtue in itself, lifted up on high or left below, according as it pleased the sun, its foster father. But it is lighter yet. It is but appearing, a fantastic vapor, an apparition, nothing real. It is not so much as a mist, not the matter of a shower, nor substantial enough to make a cloud. But it is like Cassiopeia's chair, or Pelops' shoulder, or the circles of heaven, for which you cannot have a word that can signify ever near nothing. And yet the expression is one degree more diminutive, a vapor, and fantastical, or a mere appearance, and this but for a little while neither. The very dream, the phantasm, disappears in a small time, like the shadow of that departed, or like a tale that is told, or as a dream when one waketh. A man is so vain, so unfixed, so perishing a creature, that he cannot long last in the scene of fancy. A man goes off and is forgotten, like the dream of a distracted person. The sum of all is this, that thou art a man, than whom there is nothing in the world any greater instance of heights and declinations, of lights and shadows, of misery and folly, of laughter and tears, of groans and death. And because this consideration is of great usefulness and great necessity to many purposes of wisdom and the spirit, all the succession of time, all the changes in nature, all the varieties of light and darkness, the thousand thousands of accidents in the world, 
and every contingency to every man and to every creature doth preach our funeral sermon and calls us to look and see how the old sexton time throws up the earth and digs a grave where we must lay our sins or our sorrows and so our bodies till they rise again in a fair or an intolerable eternity every revolution which the sun makes about the world divides between life and death and death possesses both those portions by the next morrow and we are dead to all these months of which we have already lived and we shall never live them over again and still god makes little periods of our age first we change our world when we come from the womb to feel the warmth of the sun then we sleep and enter into the image of death in which state we are unconcerned in all the changes of the world and if our mothers or nurses die or a wild boar destroy our vineyards or our king be sick we regard it not but during that state are as disinterested as if our eyes were closed with the clay that weeps in the bowels of the earth at the end of seven years our teeth fall and die before us representing a formal prologue to the tragedy and still every seven years it is odds but we shall finish the last scene and when nature or chance or vice takes our body in pieces weakening some parts and loosing others we taste the grave and the solemnities of our own funerals first in those parts that ministered to vice and next in them that served for ornament and in a short time even they that served for necessity become useless and entangled like wheels of a broken clock baldness is but a dressing to our funerals the proper ornament of mourning and of a person entered very far into the regions and possession of death and we have many more of the same signification gray hairs rotten teeth dim eyes trembling joints short breath stiff limbs wrinkled skin short memory decayed appetite every day's necessity calls for a reparation of that portion which death fed on all night when we lay in his lap and slept in his outer chambers the very spirits of a man prey upon the daily portion of bread and flesh and every meal is a rescue from one death and lays up for another and while we think a thought we die and the clock strikes and reckons on our portion of eternity we form our words with the breath of our nostrils we have the less to live upon for every word we speak thus nature calls us to meditate of death by those things which are the instruments of acting it and god by the variety of his providence makes us see death everywhere in all variety of circumstances and dressed up for all these fancies and the expectation of every single person nature hath given us one harvest every year but death hath two and the spring and the autumn send throngs of men and women to charnel houses and the summer long men are recovering from their evils of the spring till the dog days come and the syrian star makes the summer deadly and the fruits of autumn are laid up for all the year's provision and the man that gathers them eats and surfeits and dies and needs them not and himself is laid up for eternity and he that escapes till winter only stays for another opportunity which the distempers of that quarter minister to him with great variety thus death reigns in all the portions of our time the autumn with its fruit provides disorders for us and the winter's cold turns them into sharp diseases and the spring brings flowers to strew our hearse and the summer gives green turf and brambles to bind upon our graves calentures and surfeit cold and agues are the four quarters of the year and all minister to death and you can know whither but you tread upon a dead man's bones the wild fellow in petronius that escaped upon a broken table from the furies of a shipwreck as he was sunning himself upon the rocky shore espied a man rolled upon his floating bed of waves 
ballasted with sand in the folds of his garment, and carried by his civil enemy, the sea, towards the shore to find a grave. And it cast him into some sad thoughts, that peradventure this man's wife, in some part of the continent, safe and warm, looks next month for the good man's return. Or it may be, his son knows nothing of the tempest, or his father thinks of that affectionate kiss, which still is warm upon the good man's cheek, ever since he took a kind farewell. And he weeps with joy to think how blessed he shall be when his beloved boy returns into the circle of his father's arms. These are the thoughts of mortals. This is the end and sum of all their design. A dark night and an ill guide. A boisterous sea and a broken cable. A hard rock and a rough wind. Dashed in pieces the fortune of a whole family. And they that shall weep loudest for the accident are not yet entered into the storm, and have yet suffered shipwreck. Then looking upon the carcass, he knew it, and found it to be the master of the ship, who, the day before, cast up the accounts of his patrimony and his trade, and named the day when he thought to be at home. See how the man swims who was so angry two days since. His passions are becalmed with the storm. His accounts cast up his cares at an end, his voyage done, and his gains are the strange events of death, which, whether they be good or evil, the men that are alive seldom trouble themselves concerning the interest of the dead. But seas alone do not break our vessel in pieces. Everywhere we may be shipwrecked. A valiant general, when he is to reap the harvest of his crowns and triumphs, fights unprosperously, or falls into a fever with joy and wine, and changes his laurel into cypress, his triumphal chariot into a hearse, dying the night before he was appointed to perish in the drunkenness of his festal joys. It was a sad arrest of the loosenesses and wilder feasts of the French court, when their king, Henry the Second, was killed really by the sportive image of a fight and many brides have died under the hands of paranymphs and maidens, dressing them for uneasy joy, the new and undiscerned chains of marriage, according to the saying of Bensira, the wise Jew. The bride went into her chamber, and knew not what should befall her there. Some have been paying their vows, and giving thanks for a prosperous return to their own house, and the roof hath descended upon their heads, and turned their loud religion, into the deeper silence of a grave. And how many teeming mothers have rejoiced over their swelling wombs, and pleased themselves in becoming the channels of blessing to a family, and the midwife hath quickly bound their heads and feet, and carried them forth to burial. Or else the birthday of an heir hath seen the coffin of the father brought into the house, and the divided mother hath been forced to travail twice, with a painful birth and a sudden death. There is no state, no accident, no circumstance of our life, but it hath soured by some sad instance of a dying friend. A friendly meeting often ends in some mischance, and makes an eternal parting, and when the poet, Aeschylus, was sitting under the walls of his house, an eagle hovering over his bald head mistook it for a stone, and let fall his oyster, hoping there to break the shell, but pierced the poor man's skull. Death meets us everywhere. It is procured by every instrument, and in all chances, and enters in at many doors, by violent and secret influence, by the aspect of a star and the stink of a mist, by the emissions of a cloud and the meeting of a vapor, by the fall of a chariot and the stumbling at a stone, by a full meal or on an empty stomach, by watching at the wine or by watching at prayers, by the sun or the moon, by a heat or a cloud, by sleepless nights or sleeping days, by water frozen into the hardness and sharpness of a dagger, or water thawed into the floods of a river, or by a hair or a raisin, by violent motion or sitting still, by severity or disillusion, by God's mercy or God's anger, by everything in providence and everything in manners, by everything in nature and everything in chance. Eripitur persona, 
Manetus. We take pains to heap up things useful to our life, and get our death in the purchase. And the person is snatched away, and the goods remain. And all this is the law and constitution of nature. It is a punishment to our sins, the unalterable event of providence, and the decree of heaven. The chains that confine us to this condition are strong as destiny, and immutable as the eternal laws of God. I have conversed with some men who rejoice in the death or calamity of others, and accounted it as a judgment upon them for being on the other side, and against them in the contention. But within the revolution of a few months the same man met with a more uneasy and unhandsome death, which when I saw, I wept and was afraid. For I knew that it must be so with all men, for we also shall die and end our quarrels and contentions by passing to a final sentence. End of section 1 Section 2 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor Chapter 1, Section 2 The Consideration Reduced to Practice It will be very material to our best and noblest purposes if we represent this scene of change and sorrow a little more dressed up in circumstances. For so we shall be more apt to practice those rules, the doctrine of which is consequent to this consideration. It is a mighty change that is made by the death of every person, and it is visible to us who are alive. Reckon but from the sprightfulness of youth, and the fair cheeks and full eyes of childhood, from the vigorousness and strong flexure of the joints of five and twenty, to the hollowness and dead paleness, to the loathsomeness and horror of a three days burial, and we shall perceive the distance to be very great and very strange. But so I have seen a rose newly springing from the clefts of its hood, and, at first, it was fair as the morning, and full with the dew of heaven, as a lamb's fleece. But when a ruder breath had forced open its virgin modesty, and dismantled its too youthful and unripe retirements, it began to put on darkness, and to decline to softness and the symptoms of sickly age. It bowed the head, and broke its stalk, and at night, having lost some of its leaves and all its beauty, it fell into the portion of weeds and outworn faces. The same is the portion of every man and every woman, the heritage of worms and serpents, rottenness and cold dishonor, and our beauty so changed that our acquaintance quickly knew us not, and that change mingled with so much horror else meets so with our fears and weak discoursings, that they who, six hours ago, tended upon us, either with charitable or ambitious services, cannot, without some regret, stay in the room alone where the body lies stripped of its life and honor. I have read of a fair young German gentleman, who, living, often refused to be pictured, but put off the importunity of his friend's desire by giving way that, after a few days' burial, they might send a painter to his vault, and, if they saw cause for it, draw the image of his death unto the life. They did so, and found his face half-eaten, and his midriff and backbone full of serpents. And so he stands pictured among his armed ancestors. So does the fairest beauty change, and it will be as bad with you and me, and then what servants shall we have to wait upon us in the grave? What friends to visit us? What officious people to cleanse away the moist and unwholesome cloud reflected upon our faces from the sides of the weeping vaults, which are the longest weepers for our funeral? This discourse will be useful if we consider and practice the following rules and considerations respectively. 1. All the rich and all the covetous men in the world will perceive, and all the world will perceive for them, 
that it is but an ill recompense for all their cares that by this time all that shall be left will be this that the neighbours shall say he died a rich man and yet his wealth will not profit him in the grave but hugely swell the sad accounts of his doomsday and he that kills the lord's people with unjust or ambitious wars for an unrewarding interest shall have this character that he threw away all the days of his life that one year might be reckoned with his name and computed by his reign or consulship and many men by great labors and affronts many indignities and crimes labor only for a pompous epithet and a loud title upon their marble whilst those into whose possessions their heirs or kindred are entered are forgotten and lie unregarded as their ashes without any concernment or relation as the turf upon the face of their grave a man may read a sermon the best and most passionate that ever man preached if he shall but enter into the sepulchres of kings in the same escurial where the spanish princes live in greatness and power and decree war or peace they have wisely placed a cemetery where their ashes and their glory shall sleep till time shall be no more and where our kings have been crowned their ancestors lie interred and they must walk over their grandsire's head to take his crown there is an acre sown with royal seed the copy of the greatest change from rich to naked from sealed roofs to arched coffins from living like gods to die like men there is enough to cool the flames of lust to abate the heights of pride to appease the itch of covetous desires to sully and dash out the dissembling colors of a lustful artificial and imaginary beauty there the warlike and the peaceful the fortunate and the miserable the beloved and the despised princes mingle their dust and pay down their symbol of mortality and tell all the world that when we die our ashes shall be equal to kings and our accounts easier and our pains for our crowns shall be less to my apprehension it is a sad record which is left by athenius concerning ninus the great assyrian monarch whose life and death are summed up in these words ninus the assyrian had an ocean of gold and other riches more than the sand of the caspian sea he never saw the stars and perhaps he never desired it he never stirred up the holy fire among the magi nor touched his god with the sacred rod according to the laws he never offered sacrifice nor worshipped the deity nor administered justice nor spake to his people nor numbered them but he was most valiant to eat and drink and having mingled his wines he threw the rest upon the stores this man is dead behold his sepulchre and now hear where ninus is some time i was ninus and drew the breath of a living man but now am nothing but clay i have nothing but what i did eat and what i served to myself in lust that was and is all my portion the wealth with which i was esteemed blessed my enemies meeting together shall bear away as the mad thades carry a new goat i am gone to hell and when i went thither i neither carried gold nor horse nor silver chariot i that wore a mitre am now a little heap of dust i know not anything that can better represent the evil condition of a wicked man or a changing greatness from the greatest secular dignity to dust and ashes his nature bears him and from thence to hell his sins carry him and there he shall be for ever under the dominion of chains and devils wrath and an intolerable calamity this is the reward of an unsanctified condition and a greatness ill-gotten or ill-administered two let no man extend his thoughts or let his hopes wander towards future and far distant events and accidental contingencies the day is mine and yours but ye know not what shall be on the morrow and every morning creeps out of a dark cloud leaving behind it an ignorance and silence deep as midnight 
and undiscerned as the phantasms that make a chrism child to smile, so that we cannot discern what comes hereafter unless we had a light from heaven brighter than the vision of an angel, even the spirit of prophecy. Without revelation we cannot tell whether we shall eat tomorrow or whether a squincy shall choke us. And it is written in the unrevealed folds of divine predestination that many who are this day alive shall tomorrow be laid upon the cold earth, and the women shall weep over their shroud and dress them for their funeral. St. James, in his epistle, notes the folly of some men, his contemporaries, who were so impatient of the event of tomorrow or the accidents of next year, or the good or evils of old age, that they would consult astrologers and witches, oracles and devils, what should befall them the next calends, what should be the event of such a voyage, what God had written in his book concerning the success of battles, the election of emperors, the heirs of families, the price of merchandise, the return of the Tyrian fleet, the rate of Sidonian carpets, and as they were taught by the crafty and lying demons, so they would expect the issue, and oftentimes, by disposing their affairs in order towards such events, really did produce some little accidents according to their expectation, and that made them trust the oracles in greater things, and in all. Against this he opposes his counsel, that we should not search after forbidden records, much less by uncertain significations, for whatsoever is disposed to happen by the order of natural causes or civil counsels may be rescinded by a peculiar decree of providence, or be prevented by the death of the interested persons who, while their hopes are full, and their causes conjoined, and the work brought forward, and the sickle put into the harvest, and the first fruits offered and ready to be eaten, even then, if they put forth their hand to an event that stands but at the door, at that door their body may be carried forth to burial before the expectation shall enter into fruition. When Recalda, the widow of Albert Earl of Ebersberg, had feasted the Emperor Henry the Third, and petitioned in behalf of her nephew Welfo for some lands formerly possessed by the Earl her husband, just as the emperor held out his hand to signify his consent, the chamber floor suddenly fell under them, and Richilda, falling upon the edge of a bathing vessel, was bruised to death, and stayed not to see her nephew sleep in those lands which the emperor was reaching forth to her, and placed at the door of restitution. 3. As our hopes must be confined, so must our designs— let us not project long designs, crafty plots, and diggings so deep, that the intrigues of a design shall never be unfolded till our grandchildren have forgotten our virtues or vices. The work of our soul is cut short, facile, sweet, and plain, and fitted to the small portions of our shorter life, and as we must not trouble our iniquity, so neither must we intricate our labor and purposes with what we shall never enjoy. This rule does not forbid us to plant orchards, which shall feed our nephews with their fruit, for by such provisions they do something towards an imaginary immortality, and do charity to their relatives. But such projects are reproved which discompose our present duty by long and futile designs, such which, by casting our labors to events at distance, make us less to remember our death standing at the door. It is fit for a man to work for his day's wages, or to contrive for the hire of a week, or to lay a train to make provisions for such time as is within our eye, and in our duty, and within the usual periods of man's life. For whatsoever is made necessary is also made prudent. But while we plot and busy ourselves in the toil of an ambitious war, or the levies of a great estate, night enters in upon us, and tells all the world how like fools we lived, and how deceived and miserably we died. Seneca tells of Senecio Cornelius, a man crafty in getting, and tenacious in holding, a great estate, and one who was as diligent in the care of his body as of his money, curious of his health and of his possessions, that he all day long attended upon his sick and dying friend but when he went away was quickly comforted, supped merrily, 
went to bed cheerfully and on a sudden being surprised by as quincy scarce drew his breath until the morning but by that time died being snatched from the torrent of his fortune and the swelling tide of wealth and a likely hope bigger than the necessities of ten men this accident was much noted in rome because it happened in so great a fortune and in the midst of wealthy designs and presently it made wise men to consider how imprudent a person he is who disposes of ten years to come when he is not lord of to-morrow four though we must not look so far off and pry abroad yet we must be busy near at hand we must with all arts of the spirit seize upon the present because it passes from us while we speak and because in it all our certainty does consist we must take our waters as out of a torrent and sudden shower which will quickly cease dropping from above and quickly cease running in our channels here below this instant will never return again and yet it may be this instant will declare or secure the fortune of a whole eternity the old greeks and romans taught us the prudence of this rule but christianity teaches us the religion of it they so seized upon the present that they would lose nothing of the day's pleasure let us eat and drink for to-morrow we shall die that was their philosophy and at their solemn feast they would talk of death to heighten the present drinking and that they might warm their veins with a fuller chalice as knowing the drink that was poured upon their graves would be cold and without relish break the beds drink your wine crown your heads with roses and besmear your curled locks with nard for god bids you to remember death so the epigrammatist speaks the sense of their drunken principles something towards this signification is that of solomon there is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy in his labor for that is his portion for who shall bring him to see that which shall be after him but although he concludes all this be vanity yet because it was the best thing that was then commonly known that they should seize upon the present with a temperate use of permitted pleasures i had reason to say that christianity taught us to turn this into religion for he that by a present and constant holiness secures the present and makes it useful to his noble purposes he turns his condition to his best advantage by making his unavoidable fate become necessarily religion the purpose of this rule is that collect of tuscan hieroglyphies which we have from gabriel simeon our life is very short beauty is a cosinage money is false and fugitive empire is odious and hated by them that have it not and uneasy to them that have victory is always uncertain and peace most commonly is but a fraudulent bargain old age is miserable death is the period and is a happy one if it be not sorrow by the sins of our life but nothing concerns but the effects of that wisdom which employs the present time in the acts of a holy religion and a peaceable conscience for they make us to live even beyond our funerals embalmed in the spices and odors of a good name and entombed in the grave of the holy jesus where we shall be dressed for a blessed resurrection to the state of angels and of beatified spirits five since we stay not here being people but of a day's abode and our age is like that of a fly and contemporary with a gourd we must look somewhere else for an abiding city a place in another country to fix our house in whose walls and foundation is god where we must find rest or ever be restless for ever for whatsoever ease we can have or fancy here is shortly to be changed into sadness or tediousness it goes away too soon like the periods of our life or stays too long like the sorrows of a sinner its own weariness or contrary disturbance is its load or it is eased by its revolution into vanity and forgetfulness 
and where either there is sorrow or an end of joy there can be no true felicity which because it must be had by some instrument in some period of our duration we must carry up our afflictions to the mansions prepared for us above where eternity is the measure felicity is the stage angels are the company the lamb is the light and god the portion and inheritance and a section two section three of the rule and exercises of holy dying this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand the rule and exercises of holy dying by jeremy taylor chapter one section three rules and spiritual arts of lengthening our days and to take off the objection of a short life in the accounts of a man's life we do not reckon that portion of days in which we are shut up in the prison of the womb we tell our years from the day of our birth and the same reason that makes our reckoning to stay so long says also that then it begins too soon for then we are beholden to others to make the account for us for we know not of a long time whether we be alive or no having but some little approaches and symptoms of a life to feed and sleep and move a little and imperfectly is the state of an unborn child and when he is born he does no more for a good while and what is it that shall make him to be esteemed to live the life of a man and when shall that account begin for we should be loath to have the accounts of our age taken by the measures of a beast and fools and distracted persons are reckoned as civilly dead they are no parts of the commonwealth not subject to laws but secured by them in charity and kept from violence as a man keeps his ox and a third part of our life is spent before we enter into a higher order into the state of man neither must we think that the life of a man begins when he can feed himself or walk alone when he can fight or beget his like for so he is contemporary with a camel or a cow but he is first a man when he comes to a certain steady use of reason according to his proportion and when that is all the world of men cannot tell precisely some men are called at age at fourteen some at one and twenty some never but all men late enough for the life of a man comes upon him slowly and insensibly but as when the sun approaches toward the gates of the morning he first opens a little eye of heaven and sends away the spirits of darkness and gives light to a cock and calls up the lark to matins and by and by gilds the fringes of a cloud and peeps over the eastern hills thrusting out his golden horns like those that decked the brows of moses when he was forced to wear a veil because himself had seen the face of god and still while a man tells the story the sun gets up higher till he shows a fair face and a full light and then he shines one whole day under a cloud often and sometimes weeping great and little showers and sets quickly so is a man's reason and his life he first begins to perceive himself to see or taste making little reflections upon his actions of sense and can discourse of highs and dogs shells and play horses and liberty but when he is strong enough to enter into arts and little institutions he is at first entertained with trifles and impertinent things not because he needs them but because his understanding is no bigger and little images of things are laid before him like a cock-boat to a whale only to play with all but before a man comes to be wise he is half dead with gouts and consumptions with catars and aches with sore eyes and a worn-out body so that if we must not reckon the life of a man but by the accounts of his reason he is long before his soul be dressed and he is not to be called a man without a wise and an adorned soul a soul at least furnished with what is necessary toward his well-being but by that time his soul is thus furnished his body is decayed and then you can hardly reckon him to be alive when his body is possessed by so many degrees of death but there is yet another arrest at first he wants strength of body and then he wants the use of reason and when that is come it is ten to one but he stops by the impediments of vice and wants the strength of the spirit and we know that body and soul and spirit are the constituent parts of every christian man and now let us consider what that thing is which we call years of discretion 
the young man is past his tutors and arrived at the bondage of a caitiff spirit he is run from discipline and is let loose to passion the man by this time hath wit enough to choose his vice to act his lust to court his mistress to talk confidently and ignorantly and perpetually to despise his betters to deny nothing to his appetite to do things that when he is indeed a man he must for ever be ashamed of for this is all the discretion that most men show in the first stage of their manhood they can discern good from evil and they prove their skill by leaving all that is good and wallowing in the evils of folly and an unbridled appetite and by this time the young man hath contracted vicious habits and is a beast in manners and therefore it will not be fitting to reckon the beginning of his life he is a fool in his understanding and that is a sad death and he is dead in trespasses and sins and that is a sadder so that he hath no life but a natural the life of a beast or a tree in all other capacities he is dead he neither hath the intellectual nor the spiritual life neither the life of a man nor of a christian and this sad truth lasts too long for old age seizes upon most men while they still retain the minds of boys and vicious youth doing actions from principles of great folly and a mighty ignorance admiring things useless and hurtful and filling up all the dimensions of their abode with businesses of empty affairs being at leisure to attend no virtue they cannot pray because they are busy and because they are passionate they cannot communicate because they have quarrels and intrigues of perplexed causes complicated hostilities and things of the world and therefore they cannot attend to the things of god little considering that they must find a time to die in when death comes they must be at leisure for that such men are like sailors loosing from a port and tossed immediately with a perpetual tempest lasting until their cordage crack and either they sink or return back again to the same place they did not make a voyage though they were long at sea the business and impertinent affairs of most men steal all their time and they are restless in a foolish motion but this is not the progress of a man he is no further advanced in the course of a life though he reckon many years for still his soul is childish and trifling like an untaught boy if the parts of this sad complaint find the remedy we have by the same instruments also cured the evils and the vanity of a short life therefore be infinitely curious you do not set back your life in the accounts of god by the intermingling of criminal actions or the contracting of vicious habits there are some vices which carry a sword in their hand and cut a man off before his time there is a sword of the lord and there is a sword of a man and there is a sword of the devil every vice of our own managing in the manner of carnality of lust or rage ambition or revenge is a sword of satan put into the hands of a man these are the destroying angels sin is the apollyon the destroyer that is gone out not from the lord but from the tempter and we hug the poison and twist willingly with the vipers till they bring us into the regions of an irrecoverable sorrow we used to reckon persons as good as dead if they have lost their limbs and their teeth and are confined to a hospital and converse with none but surgeons and physicians mourners and divines those palting tours the dressers of bodies and souls to a funeral but it is worse when the soul the principle of life is employed wholly in the offices of death and that man was worse than dead of whom seneca tells that being a rich fool when he was lifted up from the baths and set into a soft couch asked his slaves as ego jum sedio do i now sit the beast was so drowned in sensuality and the death of his soul that whether he did sit or no he was to believe another idleness and every vice are as much of death as a long disease is or the expense of ten years and she that lives in pleasure if dead while she liveth saith the apostle and it is the style of the spirit concerning wicked persons they are dead in trespasses and sins for as every sensual pleasure and every day of idleness and useless living lops off a little branch from our short life so every deadly sin and every habitual vice does quite destroy us but innocence leaves us in our natural portions and perfect period we lose nothing of our life if we lose nothing of our soul's health and therefore he that would live a full age must avoid a sin as he would decline the regions of death and the dishonors of the grave if we would have our life lengthened let us begin betimes to live in the accounts of reason and sober counsels of religion and the spirit and then we shall have no reason to complain that our abode on earth is so short many men find it long enough and indeed it is so to all senses 
but when we spend in waste what god hath given us in plenty when we sacrifice our youth to folly our manhood to lust and rage our old age to covetousness and irreligion not beginning to live till we are to die designing that time to virtue which indeed is infirm to everything and profitable to nothing then we make our lives short and lust runs away with all the vigorous and healthful part of it and pride and animosity steal the manly portion and craftiness and interest possess old age velut ex pleno et abundante perdimus we spend it as if we had too much time and knew not what to do with it we fear everything like weak and silly mortals and desire strangely and greedily as if we were immortal we complain our life is short and yet we throw away much of it and are weary of many of its parts we complain that day is long and the night is long and we want company and seek out arts to drive the time away and then weep because it is gone too soon but so the treasure of the capital is but a small estate when caesar comes to finger it and to pay it with all his legions and the revenue of all egypt and the eastern provinces was but a little sum when they were to support the luxury of mark antony and feed the riot of cleopatra but a thousand crowns is a vast proportion to be spent in the cottage of a frugal person or to feed a hermit just so is our life it is too short to serve the ambition of a haughty prince or a usurping rebel too little time to purchase great wealth to satisfy the pride of a vainglorious fool to trample upon all the enemies of our just or unjust interest but for the obtaining virtue for the purchase of sobriety and modesty for the actions of religion god gave us time sufficient if we make the outgoings of the morning and evening that is our infancy and old age to be taken into computations of a man which we may see in the following particulars if our childhood being first consecrated by a forward baptism be seconded by a holy education and a complying obedience if our youth be chaste and temperate modest and industrious proceeding through a prudent and sober manhood to a religious old age then we have lived our whole duration and shall never die but be changed in a just time to the preparations of a better and an immortal life if besides the ordinary returns of our prayer and periodical and festival solemnities and on seldom communions we would allow to religion and studies of wisdom those great shares that are trifled away upon vain sorrow foolish mirth lust and impertinent amours and balls and reveling and banquets all that which was spent viciously and all that time that lay fallow and without employment our life would quickly amount to a great sum Tostatus Abulensis was a very painful person, and a great clerk, and in the days of his manhood he wrote so many books, and they not ill ones, that the world computed a sheet for every day of his life. I suppose they meant after he came to the use of reason and the state of a man, and John Scotus died about the two and thirtieth year of his age. And yet, besides his public disputations, his daily lectures of divinity in public and private, the books that he wrote, being lately collected and printed at Lyon, do equal the number of volumes of any two the most voluminous fathers of the Latin Church. Every man is not enabled to such employments, but every man is called and enabled to the works of a sober and a religious life, and there are many saints of God that can reckon as many volumes of religion and mountains of piety as those others did of good books. St. Ambrose, and I think from his example St. Augustine, divided every day into three tertias of employment. Eight hours he spent in charity and doing assistance to others, dispatching their business, reconciling their enmities, reproving their vices, correcting their errors, instructing their ignorances, transacting the affairs of his diocese and the other eight hours he spent in study and prayer. If we were thus minute and curious in the spending of our time, it is impossible but our life would seem very long. For so have I seen an amorous person tell the minutes of his absence from his fancied joy, and while he told the sands of his hourglass, or the throbs and little beatings of his watch, by dividing an hour into so many members, he spun out its length by number, and so translated a day into the tediousness of a month and if we tell our days by canonical hours of prayer, our weeks by a constant revolution of fasting days or days of special devotion, and over all these draw a black cypress, a veil of penitential sorrow and severe mortification, we shall soon answer the calumny and objection of a short life. He that governs the day and divides the hours hastens from the eyes and observation of a merry sinner, 
but loves to stand still and behold and tell the sighs and the number of groans and sadly delicious accents of a grieved penitent it is a vast work that any man may do if he never be idle and it is a huge way that a man may go in virtue if he never goes out of his way by a vicious habit or a great crime and he that perpetually reads good books if his parts be answerable will have a huge stock of knowledge it is so in all things else strive not to forget your time and suffer none of it to pass undiscerned and then measure your life and tell me how you find the measure of its abode however the time we live is worth the money we pay for it and therefore it is not to be thrown away when vicious men are dying and scared with the affrighting truths of an evil conscience they would give all the world for a year a month nay we read of some that called out with amazement inducias usque admane truce but till the morning and if that year or some few months were given those men think they could do miracles in it and let us a while suppose what dives would have done if he had been loosed from the plains of hell and permitted to live on earth one year would all the pleasures of the world have kept him one hour from the temple would he not perpetually have been under the hands of priests or at the feet of the doctors or by moses's chair or attending as near the altar as he could get or reviving poor lazarus or praying to god and crucifying all sin I have read of a melancholy person who saw hell but in a dream or a vision and the amazement was such that he would have chosen ten times to die rather than feel again so much of that horror and such a person cannot be fancied but that he would spend a year in such holiness that the religion of a few months would equal the devotion of many years even of a good man let us but compute the proportions if we should spend all our years of reason so as such a person would spend that one can it be thought that life would be short and trifling in which he had performed such a religion served god with so much holiness mortified sin with so great a labor purchased virtue at such a rate and so rare an industry it must needs be that such a man must die when he ought to die and be like ripe and pleasant fruit falling from a fair tree and gathered into baskets for the planter's use he that hath done all his business and is begotten to a glorious hope by the seed of an immortal spirit can never die too soon nor live too long xerxes wept sadly when he saw his army of one million three hundred thousand men because he considered that within a hundred years all the youth of that army should be dust and ashes and yet as seneca well observes of him he was the man that should bring them to their graves and he consumed all that army in two years for whom he feared and wept the death after a hundred just so we do all we complain that within thirty or forty years a little more or a great deal less we shall descend again into the bowels of our mother and that our life is too short for any great employment and yet we throw away five and thirty years of our forty and the remaining five we divide between art and nature civility and customs necessity and convenience prudent counsels and religion but the portion of the last is little and contemptible and yet that little is all we can prudently account of our lives we bring that fate and that death near us of whose approach we are so sadly apprehensive in taking the account of your life do not reckon by great distances and by the periods of pleasure or the satisfaction of your hopes or the sating of your desires but let every intermedial day and hour pass with observation he that reckons he hath lived but so many harvests think they come not often enough and that they go away too soon some lose the day with longing for the night and the night in waiting for the day hope and fantastic expectations spend much of our lives and while with passion we look for a coronation or the death of an enemy or a day of joy passing from fancy to possession without any intermedial notices we throw away a precious year and use it but as the burden of our time fit to be pared off and thrown away that we may come at those little pleasures which first steal our hearts and then steal our life a strict course of piety is the way to prolong our lives in the natural sense and to add good portions to the numbers of our years and sin is sometimes by natural casualty very often by the anger of god and the divine judgment a cause of sudden and untimely death concerning which i shall add nothing to what i have somewhere else said of this article but only the observation of epiphanius that for three thousand three hundred and thirty-two years even to the twentieth age there was not one example of a son that died before his father but the course of nature was kept that he who was first born in the descending line did first die 
I speak of natural death, and therefore Abel cannot be opposed to this observation till that terah the father of abraham taught the people a new religion to make images of clay and worship them and concerning him it was first remarked that haran died before his father terah in the land of his nativity god by an unheard-of judgment and a rare accident punishing his newly invented crime by the untimely death of his son but if i shall describe a living man a man that hath life that distinguishes him from a fool or a bird that which gives him a capacity next to angels we shall find that even a good man lives not long because it is long before he is born to this life and longer yet before he hath a man's growth he that can look upon death and see its face with the same countenance with which he hears its story that can endure all the labors of his life with his soul supporting his body that can equally despise riches when he hath them and when he hath them not that is not sadder if they lie in his neighbor's trunks nor more if they shine round about his own walls he that is neither moved with good fortune coming to him nor going from him that can look upon another man's lands evenly and pleasedly as if they were his own and yet look upon his own and use them too just as if they were another man's that neither spends his goods prodigally and a life of a fool nor yet keeps them avariciously and like a wretch that weighs not benefits by weight and number but by the mind and circumstances of him that gives them that never thinks his charity expensive if a worthy person be the receiver he that does nothing for opinion's sake but everything for conscience being as curious of his thoughts as of his actings in markets and theatres and is as much in awe of himself as a whole assembly he that knows god looks on and contrives his secret affairs as in the presence of god and his holy angels that eats and drinks because he needs it not that he may serve a lust or load his belly he that is bountiful and cheerful to his friends and charitable and apt to forgive his enemies that loves his country and obeys his prince and desires and endeavors nothing more than that he may do honor to god this person may reckon his life to be the life of a man and compute his months not by the course of the sun but the zodiac and circle of his virtues because these are such things which fools and children and birds and beasts cannot have these are therefore the actions of life because they are the seeds of immortality that day in which we have done some excellent thing we may as truly reckon to be added to our life as were the fifteen years to the days of hezekiah end of section three Section 4 of the Rule and Exercise of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Chapter 1, Section 4 Considerations of the Miseries of Man's Life. As our life is very short, so it is very miserable and therefore it is well it is short god in pity to mankind lest his burden should be insupportable and his nature an intolerable load hath reduced our state of misery to an abbreviator and the greater our misery is the less while it is like to last the sorrows of a man's spirit being like ponderous weights which by the greatness of their burden make a swifter motion and descend into the grave to rest and ease our wearied limbs for then only we shall sleep quietly when those fetters are knocked off which not only bound our souls in prison but also ate the flesh till the very bones opened the secret garments of their cartilages discovering their nakedness and sorrow here is no place to sit down in but you must rise as soon as you are set for we have gnats in our chambers and worms in our gardens and spiders and flies in the palaces of the greatest kings how few men in the world are prosperous what an infinite number of slaves and beggars of persecuted and oppressed people fill all the corners of the earth and groans and heaven itself with weeping prayers and sad remembrances how many provinces and kingdoms are afflicted by a violent war or made desolate by popular diseases some whole countries are remarked with fatal evils or periodical sicknesses grand cairo in egypt feels the plague every three years returning like a quartan ague and destroying many thousands of persons 
all the inhabitants of arabia the desert are in a continual fear of being buried in huge heaps of sand and therefore dwell in tents and ambulatory houses or retire to unfruitful mountains to prolong an uneasy and wilder life and all the countries round about the adriatic sea feel such violent convulsions by tempests and intolerable earthquakes that sometimes whole cities find a tomb and every man sinks with his own house made ready to become his monument and his bed is crushed into the disorders of a grave was not all the world drowned at one deluge and breach of the divine agner and shall not all the world again be destroyed by fire are there not many thousands that die every night and that groan and weep sadly every day but what shall we think of the great evil which for the sins of men god hath suffered to possess the greatest part of mankind most of the men that are now alive or that have been living for many ages are jews heathens or turks and god was pleased to suffer a base epileptic person a villain and a vicious to set up a religion which hath filled all the nearer parts of asia and much of africa and some part of europe so that the greatest number of men and women born in so many kingdoms and provinces are infallibly made mahometan strangers and enemies to christ by whom alone we can be saved this consideration is extremely sad when we remember how universal and how great an evil it is that so many millions of sons and daughters are born to enter into the possession of devils to eternal ages these evils are the miseries of great parts of mankind and we cannot easily consider more particularly the evils which happen to us being the inseparable affections or incidents to the whole nature of man we find that all the women in the world are either born for barrenness or the pains of childbirth and yet this is one of our greatest blessings but such indeed are the blessings of this world we cannot be well with nor without many things perfumes make our heads ache roses prick our fingers and in our very blood where our life dwells is the scene under which nature acts many sharp fevers and heavy sicknesses it were too sad if i should tell how many persons are afflicted with evil spirits with spectres and illusions of the night and that huge multitudes of men and women live upon man's flesh nay worse yet upon the sins of men upon the sins of their sons and of their daughters and they pay their souls down for the bread they eat buying this day's meal with the price of last night's sin or if you please in charity to visit a hospital which is indeed a map of the whole world there you shall see the effects of adam's sin and the ruins of human nature bodies laid up in heaps like the bones of a destroyed town homines pericit spiritus et mel herentis men whose souls seem to be borrowed and are kept there by art and the force of medicine whose miseries are so great that few people have charity or humanity enough to visit them fewer have the heart to dress them and we pity them in civility or with a transient prayer but we do not feel their sorrows by the mercies of a religious pity and therefore as we leave their sorrows in many degrees unrelieved and uneased so we contract by our unmercifulness a guilt by which ourselves become liable to the same calamities those many that need pity and those infinities of people that refuse to pity are miserable upon a several charge but yet they almost make up all mankind all wicked men are in love with that which entangles them in huge varieties of troubles they are slaves to the worst of masters to sin and to the devil to a passion and to an imperious woman good men are forever persecuted and god chastises every son whom he receives and whatsoever is easy is trifling and worth nothing and whatsoever is excellent is not to be obtained without labor and sorrow and the conditions and states of men that are free from great cares are such as have in them nothing rich and orderly and those that have are stuck full of thorns and trouble kings are full of care and learned men in all ages have been observed to be very poor honestas miseris accusant they complain of their honest miseries but these evils are notorious and confessed even they also whose felicity men stare at and admire besides their splendor and the sharpness of their light will with their appendant sorrows wring a tear from the most resolved eye for not only the winter is full of storms and cold and darkness but the beauteous spring hath blasts and sharp frosts the fruitful teeming summer is melted with heat and burnt with the kisses of the sun her friend and choked with dust and the rich autumn is full of sickness and we are weary of that which we enjoy because sorrow is its biggest portion
and when we remember that upon the fairest face is placed one of the worst sinks of the body the nose we may use it not only as a mortification to the pride of beauty but as an alley to the fairest outside of condition which any of the sons and daughters of adam do possess for look upon kings and conquerors i will not tell that many of them fall into the condition of servants and their subjects rule over them and stand upon the ruins of their families and that to such persons the sorrow is bigger than usually happens in smaller fortunes but let us suppose them still conquerors and see what a goodly purchase they get by all their bounds of the river rhine i speak in the style of roman greatness for nowadays the biggest fortune swells not beyond the limits of a petty province or two and a hill confines the progress of their prosperity or a river checks it but whatsoever tempts the pride and vanity of ambitious persons is not so big as the smallest sar which we see scattered in disorder and unregarded upon the pavement and floor of heaven and if we would suppose the persmires had but our understandings they also would have the method of a man's greatness and divide their little molehills into provinces and exarchates and if they also grew as vicious and as miserable one of their princes would lead an army out and kill his neighbor ants that he might reign over the next handful of a turf but then if we consider at what price and with what felicity all this is purchased the sting of the painted snake will quickly appear and the fairest of their fortunes will properly enter into this account of human infelicities we may guess at it by the constitution of augustus's fortune who struggled for his power first with the roman citizens then with brutus and cassius and all the fortune of the republic then with his colleague mark antony then with his kindred and nearest relatives and after he was wearied with the slaughter of the romans before he could sit down and rest in his imperial chair he was forced to carry armies into macedonia galatia beyond euphrates rhine and danubius and when he dwelt at home in greatness and within the circles of a mighty power he hardly escaped the sword of the egnati of lepidus caipio and marurena and after he had entirely reduced the felicity and grandeur into his own family his daughter his only child conspired with many of the young nobility and being joined with adulterous complications as with an impious sacrament they affrighted and destroyed the fortune of the old man and wrought him more sorrow than all the troubles that were hatched in the baths and beds of egypt between antony and cleopatra this was the greatest fortune that the world had then or ever since and therefore we cannot expect it to be better in a less prosperity the prosperity of this world is so infinitely soured with the overflowing of evils that he is counted the most happy that hath the fewest all conditions being evil and miserable they are only distinguished by the number of calamities the collector of the roman and foreign examples when he had reckoned two and twenty instances of great fortunes every one of which had been allayed with great variety of evils in all his reading or experience he could tell but of two who had been famed for an entire prosperity quintus metellus and gyges the king of lydia and yet concerning the one of them he tells that his felicity was so considerable and yet it was the bigger of the two that the oracle said that aglas the sophidius the poor arcadian shepherd was more happy than he that is he had fewer troubles for so indeed we are to reckon the pleasures of this life the limit of our joy is the absence of some degree of sorrow and he that hath the least of this is the most prosperous person but then we must look for prosperity not in palaces or courts of princes not in the tents of conquerors or in the gaieties of fortunate and prevailing sinners but rather in the cottages of honest innocent and contented persons whose mind is no bigger than their fortune nor their virtue less than their security as for others whose fortune looks bigger and allures fools to follow it like the wandering fires of the night till they run into rivers or are broken upon rocks with staring and running after them they are all in the condition of marius than whose condition nothing was more constant and nothing more mutable if we reckon them amongst the miserable they are the most miserable for just as is a man's condition great or little so is the state of his misery all have their share but kings and princes great generals and councils rich men and mighty as they have the biggest business and the biggest charge and are answerable to god for the greatest accounts so they have the biggest trouble that the uneasiness of their appendage may divide the good and evil of the world making the poor man's fortune as eligible as the greatest 
and also restraining the vanity of man's spirit, which a great fortune is apt to swell from a vapour to a bubble. But God in mercy hath mingled wormwood with their wine, and so restrained the drunkenness and follies of prosperity. Man never hath one day to himself of entire peace from the things of the world, but either something troubles him, or nothing satisfies him, or his very fullness swells him and makes him breathe short upon his bed. Men's joys are troublesome, and besides that the fear of losing them takes away the present pleasure, and a man hath need of another felicity to preserve this. They are also wavering and full of trepidation, not only from their inconstant nature, but from their weak foundation. They arise from vanity, and they dwell upon ice, and they converse with the wind, and they have the wings of a bird, and are serious but as the resolutions of a child, commenced by chance, and managed by folly, and proceeded by inadvertency, and end in vanity and forgetfulness. So that, as Livius Drusus said of himself, he never had any play-days or days of quiet when he was a boy, for he was troublesome and busy, a restless and unquiet man. The same may every man observe to be true of himself. He is always restless and uneasy. He dwells upon the waters, and leans upon the thorns, and lays his head upon a sharp stone. End of section 4《Section 5 of the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor Chapter 1, Section 5 The Consideration Reduced to Practice The effect of this consideration is this that the sadnesses of this life help to sweeten the bitter cup of death for let our life be never so long if our strength were great as that of oxen and camels if our sinews were strong as the cordage at the foot of an oak if we were as fighting and prosperous people as Siccius dentatus who was on the prevailing side in a hundred and twenty battles who had three hundred and twelve public rewards assigned him by his generals and princes for his valor and conduct in sieges and sharpen nine triumphs yet still the period shall be that all this shall end in death and the people shall talk of us a while good or bad according as we deserve or as they please and once it shall come to pass that concerning every one of us it shall be told in the neighborhood that we are dead this we are apt to think a sad story but therefore let us help it with a sadder for we therefore need not be much troubled that we shall die because we are not here in ease nor do we dwell in a fair condition but our days are full of sorrow and anguish dishonored and made unhappy with many sins with a frail and a foolish spirit entangled with difficult cases of conscience ensnared with passions amazed with fears full of cares divided with curiosities and contradictory interests made airy and impertinent with vanities abused with ignorance and prodigious errors made ridiculous with a thousand weaknesses worn away with labors loaden with diseases daily vexed with dangers and temptations and in love with misery we are weakened with the delights afflicted with want with the evils of myself and of all my family and with the sadnesses of all my friends and of all good men even of the whole church and therefore methinks we need not be troubled that god is pleased to put an end to all these troubles and to let them sit down in a natural period which if we please may be to us the beginning of a better life when the prince of persia wept because his army should all die in the revolution of an age artabanus told him that they should all meet with evils so many and so great that every man of them should wish himself dead long before that indeed it were a sad thing to be cut off the stone and we that are in health tremble to think of it but the man that is wearied with the disease looks upon that sharpness as upon his cure and remedy and as none need to have a tooth drawn so none could well endure it but he that felt the pain of it in his head so is our life so full of evils that therefore death is no evil to them that have felt the smart of this or hope for the joys of a better but as it helps to ease a certain sorrow as a fire draws out fire and a nail drives forth a nail so it instructs us in a present duty that is that we should not be so fond of a perpetual storm nor dote upon the transient gods and gilded thorns of this world 
they are not worth a passion nor worth a sigh or a groan not of the price of one night's watching and therefore they are mistaken and miserable persons who since adam planted thorns round about paradise are more in love with the hedge than with the fruits of the garden sottish admirers of things that hurt them a sweet poisons gilded daggers and silken halters tell them they have lost a bounteous friend a rich purchase a fair farm a wealthy donative and you dissolve their patience it is an evil bigger than their spirit can bear it brings sickness and death they can neither eat nor sleep with such a sorrow but if you represent to them the evils of a vicious habit and the dangers of a state of sin if you tell them they have displeased god and interrupted their hopes of heaven it may be they will be so civil as to hear it patiently and to treat you kindly and first to commend and then forget your story because they prefer this world with all its sorrows before the pure unmingled felicities of heaven but it is strange that any man should be so passionately in love with the thorns which grow on his own ground that he should wear them for armlets and knit them in his shirt and prefer them before a kingdom and immortality no man loves this world the better for his being poor but men that love it because they have great possessions love it because it is troublesome and chargeable full of noise and temptation because it is unsafe and ungoverned flattered and abused and he that considers the troubles of an overlong garment and of a crammed stomach a trailing gown and a loaden table may justly understand that all that for which men are so passionate is their hurt and their objection that which a temperate man would avoid and a wise man cannot love he that is no fool but can consider wisely if he be in love with this world we need not despair but that a witty man might reconcile him with tortures and make him think charitably of the rack and be brought to dwell with vipers and dragons and entertain his guests with the shrieks of mandrakes cats and screech owls with the fling of iron and the harshness of rending silk or to admire the harmony that is made by a herd of evening wolves when they miss their draught of blood in their midnight revels the groans of a man in a fit of the stone are worse than these and the distractions of a troubled conscience are worse than those groans and yet a careless merry sinner is worse than all that but if we could from one of the battlements of heaven espy how many men and women at this time lie fainting and dying for want of bread how many young men are hewn down by the sword of war how many poor orphans are now weeping over the graves of their father by whose life they were enabled to eat if we could but hear how many mariners and passengers are at present in a storm and shriek out because their keel dashes against a rock or bulges under them how many people there are that weep with want and are mad with oppression or are desperate by too quick a sense of a constant infelicity in all reason we should be glad to be out of the noise and participation of so many evils this is a place of sorrow and tears of great evils and a constant calamity let us remove from hence at least in affections and preparation of mind end of section five section six of the rule and exercises of holy dying this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Bunn of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Chapter 2 A General Preparation Towards a Holy and Blessed Death by Way of Exercise. Three Precepts Preparatory to a Holy Death to be Practiced in Our Whole Life. 1. He that would die well must always look for death, every day knocking at the gates of the grave and then the gates of the grave shall never prevail upon him to do him mischief. This was the advice of all the wise and good men of the world, who, especially in the days and periods of their joy and festival egressions, chose to throw some ashes into their chalices, some sober remembrances of their fatal period. Such was the black shirt of Saladin, the tombstone presented to the emperor of Constantinople on his coronation day, the bishop of Rome's two reeds with flax and a fax taper the Egyptian skeleton served up at feasts, and Tremalcian's banquet in Petronius, in which was brought in the image of a dead man's bones of silver, with spondles exactly returning to every of the guests, and saying to every one, 
that you and you must die, and look not one upon another, for every one is equally concerned in this sad representment. These and fantastic semblances declare a severe counsel and useful meditation, and it is not easy for a man to be gay in his imagination, or to be drunk with joy or wine, pride or revenge, who considers sadly that he must, ere long, dwell in a house of darkness and dishonor, and his body must be the inheritance of worms, and his soul must be what he pleases, even as a man makes it here by his living good or bad. I have read of a young hermit, who, being passionately in love with a young lady, could not, by all the arts of religion and mortification, suppress the trouble of that fancy, till at last, being told that she was dead, and had been buried about fourteen days, he went secretly to her vault, and with the skirt of his mantle wiped the moisture from the carcass, and still at the return of his temptation laid it before him, saying, Behold, this is the beauty of the woman thou didst so much desire, and so the man found his cure. And if we make death as present to us, our own death, dwelling and dressed in all its pomp of fancy and proper circumstances, if anything will quench the heats of lust, or the desires of money, or the greedy, passionate affections of this world, this must do it. But withal, the frequent use of this meditation, by curing our present inordinations, will make death safe and friendly, and by its very custom will make that the king of terrors shall come to us without his affrighting dresses, and that we shall sit down in the grave as we compose ourselves to sleep, and do the duties of nature and choice. The old people that lived near the Riffian mountains were taught to converse with death, and to handle it on all sides, and to discourse of it as of a thing that will certainly come, and ought so to do. Thence their minds and resolutions became capable of death, and they thought it a dishonorable thing with greediness to keep a life that must go from us, to lay aside its thorns, and to return again circled with a glory and a diadem. 2. He that would die well must, all the days of his life, lay up against the day of death, not only by the general provisions of holiness and a pious life indefinitely, but provisions proper to the necessities of that great day of expense, in which a man is to throw his last cast for an eternity of joys or sorrows, ever remembering that this alone well performed is not enough to pass us into paradise, but that alone done foolishly is enough to send us to hell and the want of either a holy life or death makes a man to fall short of the mighty price of our high calling. In order to this rule we are to consider what special graces we shall then need to exercise, and by the proper arts of the Spirit, by a heap of proportioned arguments, by prayers, and a great treasure of devotion laid up in heaven, provide beforehand a reserve of strength and mercy. Men in the course of their lives walk lazily and incuriously, as if they had both their feet in one shoe, and when they are passably revolved to the time of their dissolution, they have no mercies in store, no patience, no faith, no charity to God or despite of the world, being without gust or appetite for the land of their inheritance which Christ with so much pain and blood had purchased for them. When we come to die, indeed, we shall be very much put to it to stand firm upon the two feet of a Christian, faith and patience. When we ourselves are to use the articles, to turn our former discourses into present practice, and to feel what we never felt before, we shall find it to be quite another thing to be willing presently to quit this life and all our present possessions for the hopes of a thing which we were never suffered to see, and such a thing of which we may fail so many ways, and of which, if we fail any, we are miserable for ever then we shall find how much we have need to have secured the Spirit of God and the grace of faith by an habitual, perfect, unmovable resolution. The same also is the case of patience, which will be assaulted with sharp pains, disturbed fancies, great fears, want of a present mind, natural weaknesses, frauds of the devil, and a thousand accidents and imperfections. It concerns us therefore highly, in the whole course of our lives, not only to accustom ourselves to a patient suffering of injuries and affronts, of persecutions and losses, of cross accidents and unnecessary circumstances, but also by representing death as present to us, 
to consider with what arguments then to fortify our patience, and by assiduous and fervent prayer to God all our life long to call upon Him to give us patience, and great assistances, a strong faith, and a confirmed hope, the Spirit of God and His holy angels' assistance at that time to resist and subdue the devil's temptations and assaults, and so to fortify our heart, that it break not into intolerable sorrows and impatience, and end in wretchedness and infidelity. But this is to be the work of our life, and not to be done at once, but, as God gives us time, by succession, by parts and little periods. For it is very remarkable that God, who giveth plenteously to all creatures, he hath scattered the firmament with stars, as a man sows corn in his fields, in a multitude bigger than the capacities of human order. He hath made so much variety of creatures, and gives us great choice of meats and drinks, although any one of both kinds would have served our needs, and so in all instances of nature. Yet in the distribution of our time God seems to be straight-handed, and gives it to us, not as nature gives us rivers, enough to drown us, but drop by drop, minute after minute, so that we never can have two minutes together, but He takes away one when He gives us another. This should teach us to value our time, since God so values it, and, by His so small distribution of it, tells us it is the most precious thing we have. Since, therefore, in the day of our death we can have still but the same little portion of this precious time, let us in every minute of our life, I mean in every discernible portion, lay up such a stock of reason and good works that they may convey a value to the imperfect and shorter actions of our deathbed, while God rewards the piety of our lives by His gracious acceptation and benediction upon the actions preparatory to our deathbed. 3. He that desires to die well and happily, above all things, must be careful that he do not live a soft, a delicate, and voluptuous life, but a life severe, holy, and under the discipline of the cross, under the conduct of prudence and observation, a life of warfare and sober counsels, labor and watchfulness. No man wants cause of tears and a daily sorrow. Let every man consider what he feels, and acknowledge his misery. Let him confess his sin, and chastise it. Let him bear his cross patiently, and his persecutions nobly, and his repentances willingly and constantly. Let him pity the evils of all the world, and bear his share of the calamities of his brother. Let him long and sigh for the joys of heaven. Let him tremble and fear, because he hath deserved the pains of hell. Let him commute his eternal fear with a temporal suffering, preventing God's judgment by passing one of his own. Let him groan for the labors of his pilgrimage and the dangers of his warfare. And by that time he hath summed up all these labors and duties and contingencies, all the proper causes, instruments, and acts of sorrow. He will find that for a secular joy and wantonness of spirit there are not left many void spaces of his life. It was St. James's advice. 4, 9. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy into weeping. And Bonaventure, in the life of Christ, reports that the Holy Virgin Mother said to St. Elizabeth that grace does not descend into the soul of a man but by prayer and affliction. Certain it is that a mourning spirit and an afflicted body are great instruments of reconciling God to a sinner, and they always dwell at the gates of atonement and restitution. But besides this, a delicate and prosperous life is hugely contrary to the hopes of a blessed eternity. Woe be to them that are at ease in Sion. Amos 6.1 So it was said of old. And our blessed Lord said, Woe be to you that laugh, for ye shall weep. Luke 6.25 Here or hereafter we must have our portion of sorrows. He that now goeth on his way weeping, and beareth forth good seed with him, shall doubtless come again with joy, and bring his sheaves with him. Matthew 5, 4. And certainly he that sadly considers the portion of Dives, and remembers that the account which Abraham gave him for the unavoidableness of his torment was, because he had his good things in this life, must in all reason with trembling run from a course of banquets and faring deliciously every day, as being a dangerous estate, 
and a consonation to an evil greater than all danger, the pains and torments of unhappy souls. If either by patience or repentance, by compassion or persecution, by choice or by conformity, by severity or discipline, we allay the festival follies of a soft life and profess under the cross of Christ, we shall more willingly and more safely enter into our grave. But the deathbed of a voluptuous man upbraids his little encosening prosperities, and exacts pains made sharper by the passing from soft beds and a sober mind. He that would die holily and happily must in this world love tears, humility, solitude, and repentance. End of section 6「Section 7 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Section 2. Of Daily Examination of Our Actions in the Whole Course of Our Health, Preparatory to Our Deathbed. He that will die well and happy must dress his soul by a diligent and frequent scrutiny. He must perfectly understand and watch the state of his soul. He must set his house in order before he be fit to die. And for this there is great reason and great necessity. Reasons for a Daily Examination 1. For if we consider the disorders of every day, the multitude of impertinent words, the great portions of time spent in vanity, the daily omissions of duty, the coldness of our prayers, the indifference of our spirit in holy things, the uncertainty of our secret purposes, our infinite deceptions and hypocrisies, sometimes not known, very often not observed by ourselves, our want of charity, our not knowing in how many degrees of action and purpose every virtue is to be exercised, the secret adherences of pride, and too forward complacency in our best actions, our failings in all our relations, the niceties of difference between some virtues and some vices, the secret, indiscernible passages from lawful to unlawful in the first instances of change, the perpetual mistakings of permissions for duty, and licentious practices for permissions, our daily abusing the liberty that God gives us, our unsuspected sins, in the managing a course of life certainly lawful, our little greedinesses in eating, our surprises in the proportions of our drinking, our too great freedoms and fondnesses in lawful loves, our aptness for things sensual, and our deadness and tediousness of spirit in spiritual employments. Besides infinite variety of cases of conscience that do occur in the life of every man, and in all intercourses of every life, and that the productions of sin are numerous and increasing, like the families of the northern people, or the genealogies of the first patriarchs of the world. From all this we shall find that the computations of a man's life are busy as the tables of signs and tangents, and intricate as the accounts of eastern merchants, and therefore it were but reason we should sum up our accounts at the foot of every page. I mean that we call ourselves to scrutiny every night, when we compose ourselves to the little images of death. 2. For if we make but one general account, and never reckon till we die, either we shall only reckon by great sums, and remember nothing but clamorous and crying sins, and never consider concerning particulars, or forget very many, or if we could consider all that we ought, we must needs be confounded with the multitude and variety. But if we observe all the little passages of our life, and reduce into the order of accounts and accusations, we shall find them multiply so fast, that it will not only appear to be an ease to the accounts of our deathbed, but by the instrument of shame will restrain the inundation of evils, it being a thing intolerable to human modesty to see sins increase so fast, and virtues grow up so slow, to see every day stained with the spots of leprosy, or sprinkled with the marks of a lesser evil. 3. 
it is not intended we should take accounts of our lives only to be thought religious but that we may see our evil and amend it that we dash our sins against the stones that we may go to god and to a spiritual guide and search for remedies and apply them and indeed no man can well observe his own growth in grace but by accounting a seldomer returns of sin and a more frequent victory over temptations concerning which every man makes his inquiries and search after himself in order to this it was that st paul wrote before receiving the holy sacrament let a man examine himself and so let him eat this precept was given in those days when they communicated every day and therefore a daily examination also was intended four and it will appear highly fitting if we remember that at the day of judgment not only the greatest lines of life but every branch and circumstance of every action every word and thought shall be called to scrutiny and severe judgment insomuch that it was a great truth which one said woe be to the most innocent life if god should search into it without mixtures of mercy and therefore we are here to follow st paul's advice judge yourselves and you shall not be judged of the lord the way to prevent god's anger is to be angry with ourselves and by examining our actions and condemning the criminal by being assessors in god's tribunal at least we shall obtain the favor of the court as therefore every night we must make our bed the memorial of our grave so let our evening thoughts be an image of the day of judgment five this advice was so reasonable and proper an instrument of virtue that it was taught even to the scholars of pythagoras by their master let not sleep seize upon the regions of your senses before you have three times recalled the conversation and accidents of the day examine what you have committed against the divine law what you have omitted of your duty and in what you have made use of the divine grace to the purposes of virtue and religion joining the judge reason to the legislative mind or conscience that god may reign there as a lawgiver and a judge then christ's kingdom is set up in our hearts then we always live in the eye of our judge and live by the measures of reason religion and sober counsels the benefits we shall receive by practicing this advice in order to a blessed death will also add to the account of reason and fair inducements the benefits of this exercise one by a daily examination of our actions we shall the easier cure a great sin and prevent its arrival to become habitual for to examine we suppose to be a relative duty and instrumental to something else we examine ourselves that we may find out our failings and cure them and therefore if we use our remedy when the wound is fresh and bleeding we shall find the cure more certain and less painful for so a taper when its crown of flame is newly blown off retains a nature so symbolical to light that it will with greediness rekindle volical to light that it will with greediness rekindle and snatch a ray from the neighbor fire so is the soul of man when it is newly fallen into sin although god be angry with it and the state of god's favor and its own graciousness is interrupted yet the habit is not naturally changed and still god leaves some roots of virtue standing and the man is modest or apt to be made ashamed and he is not grown a bold sinner but if he sleeps on it and returns again to the same sin and by degrees grows in love with it and gets the custom and the strangeness of it is taken away then it is his master and is swelled into a heap and is abetted by use and corroborated by newly entertained principles and is insinuated into his nature and hath possessed his affections and tainted the will and the understanding and by this time a man is in the state of a decaying merchant his accounts are so great and so intricate and so much in arrear that to examine it will be but to represent the particulars of his calamity therefore they think it better to pull the napkin before their eyes than to state upon the circumstances of their death two a daily or frequent examination of the parts of our life will interrupt the proceeding and hinder the journey of little sins into a heap 
for many days do not pass the best person in which they have not many idle words or vainer thoughts to sully the fair whiteness of their souls some indiscreet passions or of trifling purposes some impertinent discontents or unhandsome usages of their dearest relatives and though god is not extreme to mark what is done amiss and therefore puts these upon the accounts of his mercy and the title of the cross yet in two cases these little sins combine and cluster and we know that grapes were once in so great a bunch that cluster was the load of two men that is one when either we are in love with small sins or two when they proceed from a careless and incurious spirit into frequency and continuance for so the smallest atoms that dance in all the little cells of the world are so trifling and immaterial that they cannot trouble an eye nor vex the tenderest part of a wound where a barbed arrow dwelt yet when by their infinite numbers as melissa and parmenides affirm they danced first into order then into little bodies at last they made the matter of the world so are the little indiscretions of our life they are always inconsiderable if they be not despised and god does not regard them if we do we may easily keep them asunder by our daily or nightly thoughts and prayers and severe sentences but even the least sand can check the tumultuous pride and become a limit to the sea when it is in a heap and in united multitudes but if the wind scatter and divide them the little drops and the vainer froth of the water begin to invade the strand our sighs can scatter such little offences but then be sure to breathe such accents frequently lest they knot and combine and grow big as the shore and we perish in sand in trifling instances he that despises little things shall perish by little and little so said the son of Syrach. three a frequent examination of our actions will intenerate and soften our consciences so that they shall be impatient of any rudeness or heavier load and he that is used to shrink when he is pressed with a branch of twining osier will not willingly stand in the ruins of a house when the beam dashes upon the pavement and provided that our nice and tender spirit be not vexed into scruple nor scruple turn into unreasonable fears nor the fears into superstition he that by any arts can make his spirit tender and apt for religious impressions hath made the fairest seat for religion and the unaptest and uneasiest entertainment for sin and eternal death in the whole world four a frequent examination of the smallest parts of our lives is the best instrument to make our repentance particular and a fit remedy to all the members of the whole body of sin for our examination put off to our deathbed of necessity brings us into this condition that very many thousands of our sins must be or not be at all washed off with a general repentance which the more general and indefinite it is it is ever so much the worse and if he that repents the longest and the oftenest and upon the most instances is still during his whole life but an imperfect penitent and there are very many reserves left to be wiped off by god's mercies and to be eased by collateral assistances or to be groaned for at the terrible day of judgment it will be but a sad story to consider that the sins of a whole life or of a very great portion of it shall be put upon the remedy of one examination and the advices of one discourse and the activities of a decayed body and a weak and an amazed spirit let us do the best we can we shall find that the mere sins of ignorance and unavoidable forgetfulness will be enough to be entrusted to such a bank and if that a general repentance will serve towards their expiation it will be an infinite mercy but we have nothing to warrant our confidence if we shall think it to be enough on our deathbed to confess the notorious actions of our lives and to say the lord be merciful unto me for the infinite transgressions of my life which i have wilfully or carelessly forgot from very many of which the repentance the distinct particular circumstantiate repentance of a whole life have been too little if we could have done more five after the enumeration of these advantages i shall not need to add that if we decline or refuse to call ourselves frequently to account and to use daily advices concerning the state of our souls 
it is a very ill sign that our souls are not right with god or that they do not dwell in religion but this i shall say that they who do use this exercise frequently will make their conscience much at ease by casting out a daily load of humour and surfeit the matter of diseases and the instruments of death he that does not frequently search his conscience is a house without a window and like a wild untutored son of a fond and undiscerning widow but if this exercise seem too great a trouble and that by such advices religion will seem a burden i have two things to oppose against it one one is that we had better bear the burden of the lord than the burden of a base and polluted conscience religion cannot be so great a trouble as a guilty soul and whatsoever trouble can be fancied in this or any other action of religion it is only to inexperienced persons it may be a trouble at first just as is every change and every new accident but if you do it frequently and accustom your spirit to it as the custom will make it easy so the advantages will make it delectable that will make it facile as nature these will make it as pleasant and eligible as reward two the other thing i have to say is this that to examine our lives will be no trouble if we do not intricate it with the businesses of the world and the labyrinths of care and impertinent affairs a man needs a quiet and disentangled life who comes to search into all his actions and to make judgment concerning his errors and his needs his remedies and his hopes they that have great intrigues of the world have a yoke upon their necks and cannot look back and he that covets many things greedily and snatches at high things ambitiously and that despises his neighbour proudly and bears his crosses peevishly or his prosperity impotently and passionately he that is prodigal of his precious time and is tenacious and retentive of evil purposes is not a man disposed to this exercise he hath reason to be afraid of his own memory and to dash his glass in pieces because it must needs represent to his own eyes an intolerable deformity he therefore that resolves to live well whatsoever it costs him he that will go to heaven at any rate shall best tend this duty by neglecting the affairs of the world in all things where prudently he may but of our deathbed and the examination made by a disturbed understanding will be very empty of comfort and full of inconveniences Six for hence it comes that men die so timorously and uncomfortably as if they were forced out of their lives by the violence of an executioner then without much examination they remember how wickedly they have lived without religion against the laws of the covenant of grace without god in the world when they see sin goes off like an amazed wounded affrighted person from a lost battle without honour without avail with nothing but shame and sad remembrances then they can consider that if they had lived virtuously all the trouble and objection of that would now be past and all that had remained should be peace and joy and all that good which dwells within the house of god in eternal life but now they find they have done amiss and dealt wickedly they have no bank of good works but a huge treasure of wrath and they are going to a strange place and what shall be their lot is uncertain so they say when they would comfort and flatter themselves but in truth of religion their portion is sad and intolerable without hope and without refreshment and they must use little silly arts to make them go off from their stage of sins with some handsome circumstances of opinion they will in civility be abused that they may die quietly and go decently to their execution and leave their friends indifferently contented and apt to be comforted and by that time they are gone a while they see that they deceived themselves all their days and were by others deceived at last let us make it our own case we shall come to the state and period of condition in which we shall be infinitely comforted if we have lived well or else be amazed and go off trembling because we are guilty of heaps of unrepented and unforsaken sins it may happen we shall not then understand it so because most men of late ages have been abused with false principles and they are taught or they are willing to believe that a little thing is enough to save them and that heaven is so cheap a purchase that it will fall upon them whether they will or no the mystery of it is 
they will not suffer themselves to be confuted till it be too late to recant their error in the interim they are impatient to be examined as a leper is of a comb and are greedy of the world as children of raw fruit and they hate a severe reproof as they do thorns in their bed and they love to lay aside religion as a drunken person does to forget his sorrow and all the way they dream of fine things and their dreams prove contrary and become the hieroglyphics of an eternal sorrow the daughter of polycrates dreamed that her father was lifted up and that jupiter washed him and the sun anointed him but it proved to him but a sad prosperity for after a long life of constant prosperous success he was surprised by his enemies and hanged up till the dew of heaven wet his cheeks and the sun melted his grease such is the condition of those persons who living either in the despite or in the neglect of religion lie wallowing in their drunkenness of prosperity or worldly cares they think themselves to be exalted till the evil day overtakes them and then they can expound their dream of life to end in a sad and hopeless death i remember that cleomenes was called a god by the egyptians because when he was hanged a serpent grew out of his body and wrapped itself about his head till the philosophers of egypt said it was natural that from the marrow of some bodies such productions should arise and indeed it represents the condition of some men who being dead are esteemed saints and beatified persons when their head is encircled with dragons and is entered into the possession of devils that old serpent and deceiver for indeed their life was secretly so corrupted that such serpents fed upon the ruins of the spirit and the decays of grace and reason to be cozened in making judgments concerning our final condition is extremely easy but if we be cozened we are infinitely miserable end of section seven section eight of the rule and exercises of holy dying this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humpel. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor Section 3 Of Exercising Charity During Our Whole Life He that would die well and happily must, in his lifetime, according to all his capacities, exercise charity. And because religion is the life of the soul, and charity is the life of religion, the same which gives life to the better part of man, which never dies, may obtain of God a mercy to the inferior part of man in the day of its dissolution. 1. Charity is the great channel through which God passes all his mercy upon mankind. For we receive absolution of our sins in proportion to our forgiving our brother. This is the rule of our hopes and the measure of our desire in this world. And in the day of death and judgment, the great sentence upon mankind shall be transacted according to our alms, which is the other part of charity. Certain it is that God cannot, will not, never did, reject a charitable man in his greatest needs and in his most passionate prayers. For God himself is love, and every degree of charity that dwells in us is the participation of the divine nature. And therefore, when upon our deathbed, a cloud covers our head, and we are enwrapped with sorrow when we feel the weight of a sickness, and do not feel the refreshing visitations of God's loving kindness, when we have many things to trouble us, and looking round about us we see no comforter. Then call to mind what injuries you have forgiven, how apt you were to pardon all affronts and real persecutions, how you embraced peace when it was offered you, and how you followed after peace when it ran from you. And when you are weary of one side, turn upon the other, and remember the alms that, by the grace of God and his assistances, you have done, and look up to God, and with the eye of faith behold him coming in the cloud, and pronouncing the sentence of doomsday, according to his mercies and this charity. 2. Charity with his twin daughters, alms and forgiveness, is especially effectual for the procuring of God's mercies in the day and manner of our death. Alms deliver from death, said old Tobias, and alms make an atonement for sins, 
said the son of Sirach, and so said Daniel, and so say all the wise men of the world. And in this sense also is that of St. Peter, love covers a multitude of sins. And St. Clement in his Constitutions gives this counsel, If you have anything in your hands, give it, that it may work to the remission of thy sins, for by faith and alms sins are purged. The same also is the counsel of Salvian, who wonders that men, who are guilty of great and many sins, will not work out their pardon by alms and mercy. But this also must be added out of the words of Lactanius, who makes this rule complete and useful. But think not, because thy sins are taken away by alms, that by thy money thou mayest purchase a license to sin. For sins are abolished, if, because thou hast sinned, thou givest to God, that is, to God's poor servants, and his indigent necessitous creatures. But if thou sinnest upon confidence of giving, thy sins are not abolished. For God desires infinitely that men should be purged from their sins, and therefore commands us to repent. But to repent is nothing else but to profess and affirm, that is, to purpose, and to make good that purpose, that they will sin no more. Now, alms are therefore effective to the abolition and pardon of our sins, because they are preparatory to, and imperatory of, the grace of repentance, and are fruits of repentance, and therefore St. Chrysostom affirms that repentance without alms is dead, and without wings, and can never soar upwards to the element of love. But because they are a part of repentance, and hugely pleasing to Almighty God, therefore they deliver us from the evils of an unhappy and accursed death. For so Christ delivered his disciples from the sea, when he appeased the storm, though they still sailed in the channel. And this St. Jerome verifies with all his reading and experience, saying, I do not remember to have read that ever any charitable person died an evil death. And although a long experience hath observed God's mercies to descend upon charitable people, like the dew upon Gideon's fleece, when all the world was dry, yet for this also we have a promise, which is not only an argument of a certain number of years, as experience is, but a security for eternal ages. Make ye friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations. When faith fails, and chastity is useless, and temperance shall be no more, then charity shall bear you upon wings of cherubim to the eternal mountain of the Lord. I have been a lover of mankind, and a friend, and merciful. And now I expect to communicate in that great kindness which he shows, that is the great God and Father of men and mercies, said Cyrus the Persian on his deathbed. I do not mean that this should only be a deathbed charity, any more than a deathbed repentance, but it ought to be the charity of our life and healthful years, a parting with portions of our goods then, when we can keep them. We must not first kindle our lights, when we are to descend into our houses of darkness, or bring a glaring torch suddenly to a dark room that will amaze the eye and not delight it or instruct the body. But if our tapers have, in their constant course, descended into their grave, crowned all the way with light, then let the deathbed charity be doubled, and the light burn brightest when it is to deck our hearse. But concerning this I shall afterwards give account. End of section 8 Section 9 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humpel The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor Section 4. General Considerations to Enforce the Former Practices These are the general instruments of preparation in order to a holy death. It will concern us all to use them diligently and speedily, for we must be long in doing that which must be done but once, and therefore we must begin betimes, and lose no time, especially since it is so great a venture, 
and upon it depends so great a stake. Seneca said well, there is no science or art in the world so hard as to live and die well. The professors of other arts are vulgar and many. But he that knows how to do this business is certainly instructed to eternity. But then let me remember this, that a wise person will also put most upon the greatest interest. Common prudence will teach us this. No man will hire a general to cut wood, or shake hay with a scepter, or spend his soul and all his faculties upon the purchase of a cockle-shell. But he will fit instruments to the dignity and exigence of the design, and therefore, since heaven is so glorious a state, and so certainly desired for us if we please, let us spend all that we have, all our passions and affections, all our study and industry, all our desires and stratagems, all our witty and ingenious faculties, toward the arriving thither. Whither, if we do come, every minute will infinitely pay for all the troubles of our whole life. If we do not, we shall have the reward of fools, an unpitied and an upbraided misery. To this purpose I shall represent the state of dying and dead men in the devout words of some of the fathers of the church, whose sense I shall exactly keep, but change their order, that by placing some of their dispersed meditations into a chain or sequel of discourse, I may with their precious stones make a union, and compose them into a jewel. For though the meditation is plain and easy, yet it is affectionate and material, and true and necessary. THE CIRCUMSTANCES OF A DYING MAN'S SORROW AND DANGER When the sentence of death is decreed, and begins to be put in execution, it is sorrow enough to see or feel respectively the sad accents of the agony and the last contentions of the soul, and the reluctances and unwillingnesses of the body the forehead washed with a new and stranger baptism, besmeared with a cold sweat, tenacious and clammy, apt to make it cleave to the roof of his coffin, the nose cold and undiscerning, not pleased with perfumes, nor suffering violence with a cloud of unwholesome smoke, the eyes dim as a sullied mirror, or the face of heaven, when God shows his anger in a prodigious storm, the feet cold, the hands stiff, the physicians despairing, our friends weeping, the rooms dressed with darkness and sorrow, and the exterior parts betraying what are the violences which the soul and spirit suffer. The nobler part, like the lord of the house, being assaulted by exterior rudenesses, and driven from all the outworks, at last, faint and weary with short and frequent breathings, interrupted with the longer accents of sighs, without moisture but the excrescences of a split humour, when the pitcher is broken at the cistern, it retires to its last fort, the heart, whither it is pursued, and stormed, and beaten out, as when the barbarous Thracian sacked the glory of the Grecian Empire. Then calamity is great, and sorrow rules in all the capacities of men. Then the mourners weep, because it is civil, because they need thee, or because they fear. But who suffers thee with a compassion sharp, as is thy pain? Then the noise is like the faint echo of a distant valley, and few hear, and they will not regard thee, who seemest like a person void of understanding, and of a departing interest. Vere tremendum est mortis sacramentum. But these accidents are common to all that die, and when a special providence shall distinguish them, they shall die with easy circumstances. But as no piety can secure it, so must no confidence expect it but wait for the time, and accept the manner of the dissolution. But that which distinguishes them is this. He that hath lives a wicked life. If his conscience be alarmed, and that he does not die like a wolf or a tiger, without sense or remorse, of all his wildness and his injury, his beastly nature and desert and his untilled manners, if he have but sense of what he is going to suffer, of what he may expect to be his portion, then we may expect to be his portion. Then we may imagine the terror of their abused fancies, how they see affrightening shapes, and, because they fear them, they feel the gripes of devils, urging the unwilling souls from the kinder and fast embraces of the body, calling to the grave and hastening to judgment, 
exhibiting great bills of uncancelled crimes, awaking and amazing the conscience, breaking all their hope in pieces, and making faith useless and terrible, because the malice was great, and the charity was none at all. Then they look for some to have pity on them, but there is no man. No man dares to be their pledge, no man can redeem their soul, which now feels what it never feared. Then the tremblings and the sorrow, the memory of the past sin, and the fear of future pains, and the sense of an angry God, and the presence of some devils, consign him to the eternal company of all the damned and accursed spirits. Then they want an angel for their guide, and the Holy Spirit for their comforter, and a good conscience for their testimony, and Christ for their advocate, and they die and are left in prisons of earth or air, in secret and undiscerned regions, to weep and tremble, and infinitely to fear the coming of the day of Christ, at which time they shall be brought forth to change their condition into a worse, where they shall for ever feel more than we can believe and understand. But when a good man dies, one that hath lived innocently, or made joy in heaven at his timely and effective repentance, and in whose behalf the holy Jesus hath interceded prosperously, and for whose interest the Spirit makes interpolations with groans and sighs unutterable, and in whose defense the angels drive away the devils on his deathbed, because his sins are pardoned, and because he resisted the devil in his lifetime, and fought successfully, and persevered unto the end, then the joys break forth through the clouds of sickness, and the conscience stands upright, and confesses the glory of God, and owns so much integrity that it can hope for pardon, and obtain it too. Then the sorrows of the sickness, and the flames of the fever, or the faintness of the consumption, do but untie the soul from its chain, and let it go forth, first into liberty, and then to glory. For it is but a little while that the face of the sky was black, like the preparations of the night, but quickly the cloud was torn and rent, the violence of thunder parted it into little portions, that the sun might look forth with a watery eye, and then shine without a tear. But it is an infinite refreshment to remember all the comforts of his prayers, the frequent victory over his temptations, the mortification of his lust, the noblest sacrifice to God in which he most delights that we have given our wills and killed our appetites for the interests of his services. Then all the trouble of that is gone, and what remains is a portion in the inheritance of Jesus, of which he now talks no more as a thing at distance, but is entering into the possession. When the veil is rent, and the prison doors are open at the presence of God's angel, the soul goes forth full of hope, sometimes with evidence, but always with certainty in the thing and instantly it passes into the throngs of spirits, where angels meet it singing, and the devils flock with malicious and vile purposes, desiring to lead it away with them into their houses of sorrow. There they see things which they never saw, and hear voices which they never heard. There the devils charge them with many sins, and the angels remember that themselves rejoiced when they were repented of. Then the devils aggregate, and describe all the circumstances of the sin, and add calumnies, and the angels bear the sword forward still, because their Lord doth answer for them. Then the devils rage and gnash their teeth. They see the soul chaste and pure, and they are ashamed. They see it penitent, and they despair. They perceive that the tongue was refrained and sanctified, and then hold their peace. Then the soul passes forth and rejoices, passing by the devils in scorn and triumph, being securely carried into the bosom of the Lord, where they shall rest till their crowns are finished, and their mansions are prepared, and then they shall feast and sing, rejoice and worship, for ever and ever. Fearful and formidable to unholy persons is the first meeting with spirits in their separation. But the victory which holy souls receive by the mercies of Jesus Christ and the conduct of angels is a joy that we must not understand till we feel it and yet such which, by an early and persevering piety, we may secure. But let us inquire after it no further, because it is secret. End of section 9。section 10 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Chapter 3 of the state of sickness and the temptations incident to it with their proper remedies section one of the state of sickness adam's sin brought death into the world and man did die the same day in which he sinned according as god had threatened he did not die as death is taken for a separation of soul and body that is not death properly but the ending of the last act of death just as a man is said to be born when he ceases any longer to be born in his mother's womb but whereas to man was intended a life long and happy without sickness sorrow or infelicity and this life should be lived here or in a better place and the passage from one to the other should have been easy safe and pleasant now that man sinned he fell from that state to a contrary if adam had stood he should not always have lived in this world for this world was not a place capable of giving a dwelling to all those myriads of men and women which should have been born in all the generations of infinite and eternal ages for so it must have been if man had not died at all nor yet have removed hence at all neither is it likely that man's innocence should have lost to him all possibility of going thither where the duration is better measured by a better time subject to fewer changes and which is now the reward of a returning virtue which in all natural senses is less than innocence save that it is heightened by christ to an equality of acceptation with the state of innocence but so it must have been that his innocence should have been punished with an eternal confinement to this state which in all reason is the less perfect the state of a traveller not of one possessed of his inheritance it is therefore certain man should have changed his abode for so did enoch and so did elias and so shall all the world that shall be alive at the day of judgment they shall not die but they shall change their place and their abode their duration and their state and all this without death that death therefore which god threatened to adam and which passed upon his posterity is not the going out of this world but the manner of going if he had stayed in innocence he should have gone from hence placidly and fairly without vexatious and afflictive circumstances he should not have died by sickness misfortune defect or unwillingness but when he fell then he began to die i same day so said god and that must needs be true and therefore it must mean that upon that very day he fell into an evil and dangerous condition a state of change and affliction then death began that is the man began to die by a natural diminution and aptness to disease and misery his first state was and should have been so long as it lasted a happy duration his second was a daily and a miserable change and this was the dying properly this appears in the great instance of damnation which in the style of scripture is called eternal death not because it kills or ends the duration it hath not so much good in it but because it is a perpetual infelicity change on separation of soul and body is but accidental to death death may be with or without either but the formality the curse and the sting of death that is misery sorrow fear diminution defect anguish dishonor and whatsoever is miserable and afflictive in nature that is death death is not an action but a whole state and condition and this was first brought in upon us by the offence of one man but this went no farther than thus to subject us to temporal infelicity if it had proceeded so as was supposed man had been much more miserable 
for man had more than one original sin in this sense and though this death entered first upon us by adam's fault yet it came nearer unto us and increased upon us by the sins of more of our forefathers for adam's sin left us in strength enough to contend with human calamities for almost a thousand years together but the sins of his children our forefathers took off from us half the strength about the time of the flood and then from five hundred to two hundred and fifty and from thence to one hundred and twenty and from thence to threescore and ten so often halving it till it is almost come to nothing but by the sins of men in the several generations of the world death that is misery and disease is hastened so upon us that we are of a contemptible age and because we are to die by suffering evils and by the daily lessening of our strength and health this death is so long a doing it makes so great a part of our short life useless and unserviceable that we have not time enough to get the perfection of a single manufacture but ten or twelve generations of the world must go to the making up of one wise man or one excellent art and in the succession of those ages there happen so many changes and interruptions so many wars and violences that seven years fighting sets a whole kingdom back in learning and virtue to which they were creeping it may be a whole age and thus also we do evil to our posterity as adam did to his and cham did to his and eli to his and all they to theirs who by sins caused god to shorten the life and multiply the evils of mankind and for this reason it is the world grows worse and worse because so many original sins are multiplied and so many evils from parents descend upon the succeeding generations of men that they derive nothing from us but original misery but he who restored the law of nature did also restore us to the condition of nature which being violated by the introduction of death christ then repaired when he suffered and overcame death for us that is he hath taken away the unhappiness of sickness and the sting of death and the dishonours of the grave of dissolution and weakness of decay and change and hath turned them into acts of favour into instances of comfort into opportunities of virtue christ hath now knit them into rosaries and coronets he hath put them into promises and rewards he hath made them part of the portion of his elect they are instruments and earnests and securities and passages to the greatest perfection of human nature and the divine promises so that it is possible for us now to be reconciled to sickness it came in by sin and therefore is cured when it is turned into virtue and although it may have in it the uneasiness of labor yet it will not be uneasy as sin or the restlessness of a discomposed conscience if therefore we can well manage our state of sickness that we may not fall by pain as we usually do by pleasure we need not fear for no evil shall happen to us End of section 10. Section 11 of the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor section eleven of the first temptation proper to the state of sickness impatience men that are in health are severe extractors of patience at the hands of them that are sick and they usually judge it not by terms of relation between god and the suffering man but between him and the friends that stand by the bedside it will be therefore necessary that we truly understand to what duties and actions the patience of a sick man ought to extend. 1. Sighs and groans, sorrow and prayers, humble complaints and dolorous expressions are the sad accents of a sick man's language. 
for it is not to be expected that a sick man should act a part of patience, with a countenance like an orator, or grave like a dramatic person. It were well if all men could bear an exterior decency in their sickness, and regulate their voice, their face, their discourse, and all their circumstance, by the measures and proportions of comeliness and satisfaction to all the standers by. But this would better please them than assist him. The sick man would do more good to others than he would receive to himself. 2. Therefore silence and still composures and not complaining, are no parts of a sick man's duty. They are not necessary parts of patience. We find that David roared the very disquietness of his sickness, and he lay chattering like a swallow, and his throat was dry with calling for help upon his God. That is the proper voice of sickness, and certain it is that the proper voices of sickness are expressly vocal and predatory in the ears of God and call for pity in the same accent as the cries and oppressions of widows and orphans do for vengeance upon their persecutors, though they say no collect against them. For there is the voice of man, and there is the voice of the disease, and God hears both, and the louder the disease speaks, there is the greater need for mercy and pity, and therefore God will the sooner hear it. Abel's blood had a voice, and cried to God, and humility hath a voice, and cries so loud to God that it pierces the clouds, and so hath every sorrow and every sickness, and when a man cries out and complains, but according to the sorrows of his pain, it cannot be any part of a culpable impatience, but an argument for pity. 3. Some men's senses are so subtle and their perceptions so quick and full of relish, and their spirits so active, that the same load is double upon them to what it is to another person, and therefore comparing the expressions of the one to the silence of the other, a different judgment cannot be made concerning their patience. Some natures are querulous and melancholy, and soft and nice and tender, and weeping and expressive. Others are sullen dull, without apprehension, apt to tolerate and carry burdens, and the crucifixion of our blessed Saviour, falling upon a delicate and virgin body, of curious temper and strict equal composition, was naturally more full of torment than that of the ruder thieves, whose proportions were coarser and uneven. For, in this case, it was no imprudent advice which Cicero gave. Nothing in the world is more amiable than an even temper in our whole life, and in every action. But this evenness cannot be kept unless every man follows his own nature, without striving to imitate the circumstances of another. And what is so in the thing itself ought to be so in our judgments concerning the things. We must not call anyone impatient if he be not silent in a fever as if he were asleep, or as if he were dull as Herod's son of Athens. 5. Nature in some cases hath made cryings out and exclamations to be an entertainment of the spirit, and an abatement or diversion of the pain. For so did the old champions when they threw their fatal nets that they might load their enemy with the snares and weights of death. They groaned aloud, and sent forth the anguish of their spirit into the eyes and heart of the man that stood against them. So it is in the endurance of some sharp pains, the complaints and shriekings, the sharp groans and the tender accents, send forth the afflicted spirits, and force a way that may ease their oppression and their load, that, when they have spent some of their sorrows by a sally forth, they may return better able to fortify the heart. Nothing of this is a certain sign, much less an action or part of impatience. And when our blessed Saviour suffered his last and sharpest pang of sorrow, he cried out with a loud voice and resolved to die and did so. End of section 11. Section 12. 
of the rule and exercises of holy dying this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lillis brander the ruin exercises of holy dying by jeremy taylor section three constituent or integral parts of patience one that we may secure our patience we must take care that our complaints be without despair despair sins against the reputation of god's goodness and the efficacy of all our old experience by despair we destroy the greatest comfort of our sorrows and turn our sickness into the state of devils and perishing souls no affliction is greater than despair for that is it which makes hell fire and turns a natural evil into an intolerable it hinders prayers and fills up the intervals of sickness with a worse torture it makes all spiritual arts useless and the office of spiritual comforters and guides to be impertinent against this hope is to be opposed and its proper acts as it relates to the virtue and exercise of patient are one praying to god for help and remedy two sending for the guise of souls three using all holy exercises and acts of grace proper to that state which whoso does hath not the patience of despair every man that is patient hath hope in god in the day of his sorrows two our complaints in sickness must be without murmur murmur sins against god's providence and government by it we grow rude and like the falling angels displeased at god's supremacy and nothing is more unreasonable to talk against god for whose glory all speech was made it is proud and fantastic has better opinions of a sinner than of the divine justice and would rather accuse god than himself against this is opposed the part of patience which resigns the man into the hands of god saying without eli it is the lord let him do what he will and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven and so by admiring god's justice and wisdom does also dispose the sick person for receiving god's mercy and secures him the rather in the grace of god the proper acts of this part of patience are one to confess our sins and our own demerits two it increases and exercises humility three it loves to sing praises to god even from the lowest abyss of human misery three our complaints in sickness must be without peevishness this sins against civility and that necessary decency which must be used towards the ministers and assistants by peevishness we increase our own sorrows and are troublesome to them that stand there to ease ours it hath in it harshness of nature and ungentleness wilfulness and fantastic opinions morosity and incivility against it are opposed obedience tractability easiness of persuasion aptness to take counsel the acts of this part of patience are one to obey our physicians two to treat our persons with respect to our present necessities three not to be ungentle and uneasy to the ministers and nurses that attend us but to take their diligent and kind offices as sweetly as we can and to bear their indiscretions or unhandsome accidents contentedly and without disquietness within nor evil language or angry words without four not to use unlawful means for our recovery if we secure these particulars we are not likely to be judged of by noises and postures by colours and images of things by paleness 
or tossing from side to side for it were a hard thing that those persons who are loaden with the greatest of human calamities should be strictly tied to ceremonies and forms of things he is patient that calls upon god that hopes for health or heaven that believes god is wise and just in sending him afflictions that confesses his sins and accuses himself and justifies god that expects god to return this into good that is civil to his physicians and his servants that converses with the guides of souls the ministers of religion and in all things submits to god's will and would use no indirect means for his recovery but had rather be sick and die than enter at all into god's displeasure End of section twelve recording by lilith brander Section 13 of the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Remedies Against Impatience by Way of Consideration. As it happens concerning death, so it is in sickness which is death's handmaid. It hath the fate to suffer calumny and reproach, and hath a name worse than its nature. For there is no sickness so great but children endure it, and have natural strengths to bear them out quite through the calamity, what period soever nature hath allotted it. Indeed, they make no reflections upon their sufferings, and complain of sickness with an uneasy sigh or a natural groan, but consider not what the sorrows of sickness mean, and so bear it by a direct sufferance, and as a pillar bears the weight of a roof. But then, why cannot we bear it so too? For this which we all a reflection upon, or a considering of our sickness, is nothing but a perfect instrument of trouble, and consequently a temptation to impatience. It serves no end of nature, it may be avoided, and we may consider it only as an expression of God's anger, and an emissary or procurator of repentance. But all other concerning it, except where it serves the purposes of medicine and art, is nothing but, under the color of reason, an unreasonable device to heighten the sickness and increase the torment. But then, as children want this act of reflex perception or reasonable sense, whereby they should be able to support it. For certain it is, reason was as well given us to harden our spirits, and stiffen them in passions and sad accidents, as to make us bending and apt for action. And if in men God hath heightened the faculties of apprehension, he hath increased the auxiliaries of reasonable strengths, that God's rod and God's staff might go together, and the beam of God's countenance may as well refresh us with its light as scorch us with its heat. For poor children that endure so much have not inward supports and refreshments to bear them through it. They never heard the sayings of old men, nor have been taught the principles of severe philosophy, nor are assisted with the results of a long experience, nor know they how to turn a sickness into virtue and a fever into a reward nor have they any sense of favors, the remembrance of which may alleviate their burden. And yet nature hath in them teeth and nails enough to scratch and fight against the sickness, and by such aids as God is pleased to give them, they wade through the storm and murmur not. And besides this, yet, although infants have not such brisk perceptions upon the stock of reason, they have a more tender feelings upon the accounts of sense, and their flesh is as uneasy by their natural softness and weak shoulders as ours by two forward apprehensions. Therefore bear up, either you or I, or some man wiser, and many a woman weaker than us both, or the very children, have endured worse evil than this is upon thee now. That sorrow is hugely tolerable, which gives its smart but by instance, and smallest proportions of time. 
no man at once feels the sickness of a week or of a whole day but the smart of an instant and still every portion of a minute feels but its proper share and the last groan ended all the sorrow of its peculiar burden and what minute can that be which can pretend to be intolerable and the next minute is but the same as the last and the pain flows like the drops of a river or the little shreds of time and if we do but take care of the present minute it cannot seem a great charge or a great burden but that care will secure our duty if we still but secure the present minute if we consider how much men can suffer if they list and how much they do suffer for greater and little causes and that no causes are greater than the proper causes of patience in sickness that is necessity and religion we cannot without huge shame to our nature to our persons and to our manners complain of this tax and impost of nature this experience added something to the old philosophy when the gladiators were exposed naked to each other's short swords and were to cut each other's souls away in portions of flesh as if their forms had been as divisible as the life of worms they did not sigh or groan it was a shame to decline the blow but according to the just measures of art the women that saw the wound shriek out and he that receives it holds his peace he did not only stand bravely but would also fall so and when he was down scorned to shirk his head when the insolent conqueror came to lift it from his shoulders and yet this man in his first design only aimed at liberty and the reputation of a good fencer and when he sunk down he saw he could only receive the honor of a bold man the noise of which he shall never hear when his ashes are crammed in his narrow urn and what can we complain of the weakness of our strengths or the pressures of diseases when we see a poor soldier stand in a breach almost starved with cold and hunger and his cold apt to be relieved only by the heats of anger a fever or a fired musket and his hunger slackened by a greater pain and a huge fear this man shall stand in his arms and wounds patiens luminis alque solis pale and faint weary and watchful and at night shall have a bullet pulled out of his flesh and shivers from his bones and endure his mouth to be sewed up from a violent rent to its own dimension and all this for a man whom he never saw or if he did was not noted by him but one that shall condemn him to the gallows if he runs from all this misery it is seldom that god sends such calamities upon men as men bring upon themselves and suffer willingly but that which is most considerable is that any passion and violence upon the spirit of man makes him able to suffer huge calamities with a certain constancy and an unwearied patience scipio africanus was wont to commend that saying in xenophon that the same labors of warfare were easier far to a general than to a common soldier because he was supported by the huge appetites of honor which made his hard marches nothing but stepping forward and reaching at a triumph did not the lady of sabinus for others interest bear twins privately and without groaning are not the labors and cares the spare diet and the waking nights of covetous and adulterous of ambitious or revengeful persons greater sorrows and of more smart than a fever or the short pains of childbirth what will not tender women suffer to hide their shame and if vice and passion lust and inferior appetites can supply to the tenderest persons strengths more than enough for the sufferance of the greatest natural violences can we suppose that honesty and religion and the grace of god are more nice tender and effeminate sickness is the more tolerable because it cures very many evils and takes away the sense of all the cross fortunes which amaze the spirits of some men and transports them certainly beyond all the limits of patience here all losses and disgraces domestic cares and public evils the apprehensions of pity and a sociable calamity 
the fears of want and the troubles of ambition lie down and rest upon the sick man's pillow one fit of the stone takes away from the fancies of men all relations to the world and secular interests at least they are made dull and flat without sharpness and edge and he that shall observe the infinite variety of troubles which afflict some busy persons and almost all men in very busy times will think it not much amiss that those huge numbers were reduced to certainty to method and in order and there is no better compendium for this than that they be reduced to one and a sick man seems so unconcerned in the things of the world that although this separation be done with violence yet it is no otherwise than all noble contentions are and all honours are purchased and all virtues are acquired and all vices mortified and all appetites chastised and all rewards obtained there is infallibly to all these a difficulty and a sharpness annexed without which there would be no proportion between a work and a reward to this add that sickness does not take off the sense of secular troubles and worldly cares from us by employing all the perceptions and apprehensions of men by filling all faculties with sorrow and leaving no room for the lesser instances of troubles as little rivers are swallowed up in the sea but sickness is a messenger of god sent with purposes of abstraction and separation with a great power and a proper efficacy to draw us off from unprofitable and useless sorrows and this is effected partly by reason that it represents the uselessness of the things of this world and that there is a portion of this life in which honours and things of this world cannot serve us to many purposes partly by preparing us to death and telling us that a man shall descend thither whence this world cannot redeem us and where the goods of this world cannot serve us and yet after all this sickness leaves in us appetites so strong and apprehensions so sensible and delights so many and good things in so great a degree that a healthless body and a sad disease do seldom make men weary of this world but still they would fain find excuse to live the gout the stone and the toothache the sciatica sore eyes and an aching head are evils indeed but such which rather than die most men are willing to suffer and machinus added also a wish rather to be crucified than to die and though his wish was low timorous and base yet we find the same desires in most men dressed up with better circumstances it was a cruel mercy in tamerland who commanded all the leprous persons to be put to death as we knock some beasts quickly on their head to put them out of pain and lest they should live miserably the poor men would rather have endured another leprosy and have more willingly taken two diseases than one death therefore caesar wondered that the old crazed soldier begged leave he might kill himself and asked him dost thou think then to be more alive than now thou art we do not die suddenly but we descend to death by steps and slow passages and therefore men so long as they are sick are unwilling to proceed and go forward in the finishing of that sad employment between a disease and death there are many degrees and all those are like the reserves of evil things the declining of every one of which is justly reckoned amongst those good things which alleviate the sickness and make it tolerable never account that sickness intolerable in which thou hadst rather remain than die and yet if thou hadst rather die than suffer it the worst of it that can be said is this that this sickness is worse than death that is it is worse than that which is the best of all evils and the end of all troubles and then you have said no great harm against it remember that thou art under a supervening necessity nothing is intolerable that is necessary and therefore when men are to suffer a sharp incision or what they are pleased to call intolerable tie the man down to it and he endures it now god hath bound this sickness upon thee by the condition of nature for every flower must wither and droop 
it is also bound upon thee by special providence and with a design to try thee and with purposes to reward and to crown thee these cords thou canst not break and therefore lie thou down gently and suffer the hand of god to do as he please that at least thou mayest swallow an advantage which the care and severe mercies of god force down thy throat remember that all men have passed this way the bravest the wisest and the best men have been subject to sickness and sad diseases and it is esteemed a prodigy that a man should live to a long age and not be sick and it is recorded for a wonder concerning xenophilus the musician that he lived to one hundred and six years of age in a perfect and continual health no story tells the like of a prince or a great or a wise person unless we have a mind to believe the tales concerning nestor and the euhoian sibyl or reckon cyrus of persia or massinissa the mauritanian to be rivals of old age or that argentonius the tartesian king did really outstrip that age according as his story tells reporting him to have reigned eighty years and to have lived one hundred and twenty old age and healthful bodies are seldom made the appendages to great fortunes and under so great and so universal precedence so common fate of men he that will not suffer his portion deserves to be something else than a man but nothing that is better we find in story that many gentiles who walked by no light but that of reason opinion and human examples did bear their sickness nobly and with great contempt of pain and with huge interests of virtue when pompey came from syria and called at rhodes to see poseidonins the philosopher he found him hugely afflicted with the gout and expressed his sorrow that he could not hear his lectures from which by this pain he must needs be hindered poseidonus told him but you may hear me for all this and he discoursed excellently in the midst of his tortures even then when the torches were put to his feet that nothing was good but what was honest and therefore nothing could be an evil if it were not criminal and summed up his lectures with this saying o pain in vain dost thou attempt me for i will never confess thee to be an evil as long as i can honestly bear thee and when pompey himself was desperately sick at naples the neapolitans wore crowns and triumphed and the men of puteoli came to congratulate his sickness not because they loved him not but because it was the custom of their country to have better opinions of sickness than we have the boys of sparta would at their altars endure whipping till their very entrails saw the light through their torn flesh and some of them to death without crying or complaint caesar would drink his portions of rhubarb rudely mixed and unfitly allayed with little sippings and taking the harrow of the medicine spreading the loathsomeness of his physic so that all the parts of his tongue and palate might have an entire share and when c marius suffered the veins of his leg to be cut out for the curing his gout and yet shrunk not he declared not only the rudeness of their physic but the strength of a man's spirit if it be contracted and united by the aids of reason or religion by resolution or any accidental harshness against a violent disease all impatience howsoever expressed is perfectly useless to all purposes of ease but hugely effective to the multiplying the trouble and the impatience and vexation is another but the sharper disease of the two it does mischief by itself and mischief by the disease for men grieve themselves as much as they please and when by impatience they put themselves into the retune of sorrows they become solemn mourners for so i have seen the rays of the sun or moon dash upon a brazen vessel whose lips kissed the face of those waters that lodged within its bosom but being turned back and sent off with its smooth pretenses or rougher waftings it wandered about the room and beat upon the roof and still doubled its heat and motion 
so is a sickness and a sorrow entertained by an unquiet and a discontented man turned back either with anger or with excuses but then the pain passes from the stomach to the liver and from the liver to the heart and from the heart to the head and from feeling to consideration from thence to sorrow and at last ends in impatience and useless murmur and all the way the man was impotent and weak but the sickness was doubled and grew imperious and tyrannical over the soul and body Masurian sabinus tells that the image of the goddess angerona was with a muffler upon her mouth placed upon the altar of volupia to represent that those persons who bear their sicknesses and sorrows without murmurs shall certainly pass from sorrow to pleasure and the ease and honours of felicity but they that with spite and indignation bite the burning coal or shake the yoke upon their necks gall their spirits and fret their skin and hurt nothing but themselves remember that this sickness is but for a short time if it be sharp it will not last long if it be long it will be easy and very tolerable and although saint edzine archbishop of canterbury had twelve years of sickness yet all that while he ruled his church prudently gave example of many virtues and after his death was enrolled in the calendar of saints who had finished their course prosperously nothing is more unreasonable than to entangle our spirits in wildness and amazement like a partridge fluttering in a net which she breaks not though she breaks her wings End of section 13. Section 14 of the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Chapter 3, Part 5, Remedies Against Impatience by Way of Exercise The fittest instrument of esteeming sickness easily tolerable is to remember that which indeed makes it so, and that is that God doth minister proper aids and supports to every of his servants whom he visits with his rod. He knows our needs, he pities our sorrows, he relieves our miseries, he supports our weakness, he bids us ask for help, and he promises to give us all that, and he usually gives us more. And indeed it is observable that no story tells of any godly man who, living in the fear of God, fell into a violent and unpardoned impatience in his natural sickness, if he used those means which God and his holy church have appointed. We see almost all men bear their last sickness with sorrows indeed, but without violent passions, and unless they fear death violently, they suffer the sickness with some indifferency, and it is a rare thing to see a man who enjoys his reason in his sickness to express the proper signs of a direct and solemn impatience. For when God lays a sickness upon us, he seizes commonly on a man's spirits, which are the instruments of action and business, and when they are secured from being tumultuous, the sufferance is much the easier, and therefore sickness secures all that which can do the man mischief. It makes him tame and passive, apt for suffering, and confines him to an inactive condition. To which, if we add that God then commonly produces fear, and all those passions which naturally tend to humility and poverty of spirit, we shall soon perceive by what instruments God verifies his promise to us, which is the great security for our patience, and the easiness of our condition, that God will lay no more upon us than he will make us able to bear it, but together with the affliction he will find a way to escape. Nay, if anything can be more than this, we have two or three promises in which we may safely lodge ourselves, and roll from off our thorns, and find ease and rest. God hath promised to be with us in our trouble, and to be with us in our prayers, and to be with us in our hope and confidence. Prevent the violence and trouble of thy spirit by an act of thanksgiving, for which in the worst of sickness thou canst not want cause, especially if thou rememberest that this pain is not an eternal pain. Bless God for that, but take heed also lest you so order your affairs that you pass from hence to an eternal sorrow. 
if that be hard this will be intolerable but as for the present evil a few day will end it remember that thou art a man and a christian as the covenant of nature hath made it necessary so the covenant of grace hath made it to be chosen by thee to be a suffering person either you must renounce your religion or submit to the impositions of god and thy portion of sufferings so there here we see our advantages and let us use them accordingly the barbarous and warlike nations of old could fight well and willingly but could not bear sickness manfully the greeks were cowardly in their fights as most wise men are but because they were learned and well taught they bore their sickness with patience and severity the cimmerians and celtiberians rejoice in battle like giants but in their diseases they weep like women these according to their institution and designs had unequal courages and accidental fortitude but since our religion hath made a covenant of sufferings and the great business of our lives is sufferings and most of the virtues of a christian are passive graces and all the promises of the gospel are passed upon us through christ's cross we have a necessity upon us to have an equal courage in all the variety of our sufferings for without an universal fortitude we can do nothing of our duty resolve to do as much as you can for certain it is we can suffer much if we list and many men have afflicted themselves unreasonably by not being skilful to consider how much their strength and state could permit and our flesh is nice and imperious crafty to persuade reason that she hath more necessities than indeed belong to her and that she demands nothing superfluous suffer as much in obedience to god as you can suffer for necessity or passion fear or desire and if you can for one thing you can for another and there is nothing wanting but the mind never say i can do no more i cannot endure this for god would not have sent it if he had not known thee strong enough to abide it only he that knows thee well already would also take this occasion to make thee know thyself but it will be fit that you pray to god to give you a discerning spirit that you may rightly distinguish just necessity from the flattery and fondness of flesh and blood propound to your eyes and heart the example of the holy jesus upon the cross he endured more for thee than thou canst either for thyself or him and remember that if we be put to suffer and do suffer in a good cause or in a good manner so that in any sense your sufferings be conformable to his sufferings or can be capable of being united to his we shall reign together with him the highway of the cross which the king of sufferings hath trodden before us is the way to ease to a kingdom and to felicity the very suffering is a title to an excellent inheritance for god chastens every son whom he receives and if we be not chastised we are bastards and not sons and be confident that although god often sends pardon without correction yet he never sends correction without pardon unless it be thy fault and therefore take every or any affliction as an earnest penny of thy pardon and upon condition there may be peace with god let anything be welcome that he can send as its instrument or condition suffer therefore god to choose his own circumstances of adopting thee and be content to be under discipline when the reward of that is to become the son of god and by such inflictions he hews and breaks thy body first dressing it to funeral and then preparing it for immortality and if this be effect of the design of god's love to thee let it be occasion of thy love to him and remember that the truth of love is hardly known but by somewhat that he puts us to pain use this as a punishment for thy sins and so god intends it most commonly that is certain if therefore thou submittest to it thou approvest of the divine judgment and no man can have cause to complain of anything but himself if either he believes god to be just or himself to be a sinner if he either thinks he hath deserved hell or that this little may be a means to prevent the greater and bring him to heaven it may be that this may be the last instance and the last opportunity that ever god will give thee to exercise any virtue to do him any service or thyself any advantage be careful that thou losest not this for to eternal ages this never shall return again or if thou peradventure shall be restored to health 
be careful that in the day of thy thanksgiving thou mayest not be ashamed of thyself for having behaved thyself poorly and weakly upon thy bed it will be a sensible and excellent comfort to thee and double upon thy spirit if when thou shalt worship god for restoring thee thou shalt also remember that thou didst do him service in thy suffering and tell that god was hugely gracious to thee in giving thee the opportunity of a virtue at so easy a rate as a sickness from which thou didst recover few men are so sick but they believe that they may recover and we shall seldom see a man lie down with a perfect persuasion that it is his last hour for many men have been sicker and yet have recovered but whether thou dost or no thou hast a virtue to exercise which may be a handmaid to thy patience epaphroditus was sick sick unto death and yet god had mercy upon him and he hath done so to thousands to whom he found it useful in the great order of things and the events of universal providence if therefore thou desirest to recover here is cause enough of hope and hope is designed in the arts of god and of the spirit to support patience but if thou recoverest not yet there is something that is the matter of joy naturally and very much spiritually of thou belongest to god and joy is as certain a support to patience as hope and it is no small cause of being pleased when we remember that if we recover not our sickness shall the sooner sit down in rest and joy for recovery by death as it is easier and better than the recovery by a sickly health so it is not so long in doing it suffers not the tediousness of a creeping restitution nor the inconvenience of surgeons and physicians watchfulness and care keepings in and suffering trouble fears of relapse and the little relics of a storm while we hear or use or think of these remedies part of the sickness is gone away and all of it is passing and if by such instruments we stand armed and ready dressed beforehand we shall avoid the mischiefs of amazements and surprise while the accidents of sickness are such as were expected and against which we stood in readiness with our spirits contracted instructed and put upon the defensive but our patience will be the better secured if we consider that it is not violently tempted by the usual arrests of sickness for patience is with reason demanded while the sickness is tolerable that is so long as the evil is not too great but if it be also eligible and have in it some degrees of good our patience will have in it the less difficulty and the greater necessity this therefore will be a new stock of consideration sickness is in many degrees eligible to many men and to many purposes end of section 14section 15 of the rule and exercises of holy dying this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rule and exercises of holy dying by jeremy taylor advantages of sickness i consider one of the greatest felicities of heaven consists in an immunity from sin then we shall love god without mixtures of malice then we shall enjoy without envy then we shall see fuller vessels running over with glory and crowned with bigger circles and this we shall behold without spilling from our eyes those vessels of joy and grief any sign of anger trouble or a repining spirit our passions shall be pure our charity without fear our desire without lust our possessions all our own and all in the inheritance of jesus in the richest soil of god's eternal kingdom now half of this reason which makes heaven so happy by being innocent is also in the state of sickness making the sorrows of old age smooth and the groans of a sick heart apt to be joined to the music of angels and though they sound harsh to our untuned ears and discomposed organs yet those accents must needs be in themselves excellent which god loves to hear and esteems them as prayers and arguments of pity instruments of mercy and grace and preparatives to glory in sickness the soul begins to dress herself for immortality and first 
she unties the strings of vanity that made her upper garment cleave to the world and sit uneasy first she puts off the light and fantastic summer robe of lust and wanton appetite and as soon as that cestus that lascivious girdle is thrown away then the rains chasten us and give us warning in the night then that which called us formerly to leave the manliness of the body and the childishness of the soul keeps us waking to divide the hours with the intervals of prayer and to number the minutes with our penitential groans then the flesh sets uneasily and dwells in sorrow and then the spirit feels itself at ease freed from the petulant solicitations of those passions which in health were as busy and restless as atoms in the sun always dancing and always busy and never sitting down till a sad night of grief and uneasiness draws the veil and lets them die alone in secret dishonor next to this the soul by the help of sickness knocks off the fetters of pride and vainer complacencies then she draws the curtains and stops the light from coming in and takes the pictures down those fantastic images of self-love and gay remembrances of vain opinion and popular noises then the spirit stoops into the sobrieties of humble thoughts and feels corruption chiding the forwardness of fancy and delaying the vapours of conceit and factious opinions for humility is the soul's grave into which she enters not to die but to meditate and inter some of its troublesome appendages there she sees the dust and feels the dishonours of the body and reads the register of all its sad adherences and then she lays by all her vain reflections beating upon her crystal and pure mirror from the fancies of strength and beauty and little decayed prettinesses of the body and when in sickness we forget all our naughty discourses of philosophy and a syllogism makes our head ache and we feel our many and loud talkings served no lasting end of the soul no purpose that now we must abide by and that the body is like to descend to the land where all things are forgotten then she lays aside all her remembrances of applauses all her ignorant confidences and aims only to know christ jesus and him crucified to know him plainly and with much heartiness and simplicity and i cannot think this to be a contemptible advantage for ever since man tempted himself by his impatient desires of knowing and being as god man thinks it the finest thing in the world to know much and therefore is hugely apt to esteem himself better than his brethren if he knows some little impertinences and them imperfectly and that with infinite uncertainty but god hath been pleased with a rare art to prevent the inconveniences apt to arise by this passionate longing after knowledge even by giving to every man a sufficient opinion of his own understanding and who is there in the world that thinks himself to be a fool or indeed not fit to govern his brother there are but few men but they think they are wise enough and every man believes his own opinion the soundest and if it were otherwise men would burst themselves with envy or else become irrecoverable slaves to the talking and disputing man but when god intended this permission to be an antidote of envy and a satisfaction and allay to the troublesome appetites of knowing and made that this universal opinion by making men in some proportions equal should be a keeper out or a great restraint to slavery and tyranny respectively man for so he uses to do hath turned this into bitterness for when nature had made so just a distribution of understanding that every man might think he had enough he is not content with that but will think he hath more than his brother and whereas it might well be employed in restraining slavery he hath used it to break off the bands of all obedience and it ends in pride and schisms in heresies and tyrannies and it being a spiritual evil it grows upon the soul with old age and flattery with health and the supports of a prosperous fortune now besides the direct operations of the spirit and a powerful grace there is in nature left to us no remedy for this evil but a sharp sickness or an equal sorrow and allay of fortune and then we are humble enough to ask counsel of a despised priest 
and to think that even a common sentence from the mouth of an appointed comforter streams forth more refreshment than our own wiser and more reputed discourses then our understandings and our bodies peeping through their own breaches see their shame and their dishonour their dangerous follies and their huge deceptions and they go into the clefts of the rock and every little hand may cover them next to these as the soul is still undressing she takes off the roughness of her great and little angers and animosities and receives the oil of mercies and smooth forgiveness fair interpretations and gentle answers designs of reconcilement and christian atonement in their places for so did the wrestlers in olympus they stripped themselves of all their garments and then anointed their naked bodies with oil smooth and vigorous with contracted nerves and enlarged voice they contended vehemently till they obtained their victory or their ease and a crown of olive or a huge pity was the reward of their fierce contentions some wise men have said that anger sticks to a man's nature as inseparable as other vices do to the manner of fools and that anger is never quite cured but god that hath found out remedies for all diseases hath so ordered the circumstances of man that in the worser sort of men anger and great indignation consume and shrivel into little peevishnesses and uneasy accents of sickness and spend themselves in trifling instances and in the better and more sanctified it goes off in prayers and alms and solemn reconcilement and however the temptations of this state such i mean which are proper to it are little and considerable the man is apt to chide a servant too bitterly and to be discontented with his nurse or not satisfied with his physician and he rests uneasily and poor man nothing can please him and indeed these little indecencies must be cured and stopped lest they run into an inconvenience but sickness is in this particular a little image of the state of blessed souls or of adam's early morning in paradise free from the troubles of lust and violences of anger and the intricacies of ambition or the restlessness of covetousness for though a man may carry all these along with him into his sickness yet there he will not find them and in despite of all his own malice his soul shall find some rest from laboring in the galleys and baser captivity of sin and if he value those moments of being in the love of god and in the kingdom of grace which certainly are the beginnings of felicity we may also remember that the not sinning actually is one step of innocence and therefore that state is not tolerable which by a sensible trouble makes it in most instances impossible to commit those great sins which make death hell and horrid damnations and then let us but add this to it that god sends sicknesses but he never causes sin that god is angry with a sinning person but never with a man for being sick that sin causes god to hate us and sickness causes him to pity us that all wise men in the world choose trouble rather than dishonor affliction rather than baseness and that sickness stops the torrent of sin and interrupts its violence and even to the worst men makes it to retreat many degrees we may reckon sickness amongst good things as we reckon rhubarb and aloes and childbirth and labor and obedience and discipline these are unpleasant and yet safe they are troubles in order to blessings or they are securities from danger or the hard choices of a less and a more tolerable evil sickness is in some sense eligible because it is the opportunity and the proper scene of exercising some virtues it is that agony in which men are tried for a crown and if we remember what glorious things are spoken of the grace of faith that it is the life of just men the restitution of the dead in trespasses and sins the justification of a sinner the support of the weak the confidence of the strong the magazine of promises and the title to very glorious rewards we may easily imagine that it must have in it a work and a difficulty in some proportion answerable to so great effects but when we are bidden to believe strange propositions we are put upon it when we cannot judge 
and those propositions have possessed our discerning faculties and have made a party there and are become domestic before they come to be disputed and then the articles of faith are so few and are made so credible and in their event and in their object are so useful and gaining upon the affections that he were a prodigy of man and would be so esteemed that should in all our present circumstances disbelieve any point of faith and all is well as long as the sun shines and the fair breath of heaven gently wafts us to our own purposes but if you will try the excellency and feel the work of faith place the man in a persecution let him ride in a storm let his bones be broken with sorrow and his eyelids loosened with sickness let his bread be dipped in tears and all the daughters of music be brought low let god commence a quarrel against him and be bitter in the accents of his anger or his discipline then god tries your faith can you then trust his goodness and believe him to be a father when you groan under his rod can you rely upon all the strange propositions of scripture and be content to perish if they be not true can you receive comfort in the discourses of death and heaven of immortality and the resurrection of the death of christ and conforming to his sufferings truth is there are but two great periods in which faith demonstrates itself to be a powerful and mighty grace and they are persecution and the approaches of death for the passive part and a temptation for the active in the days of pleasure and the night of pain faith is to fight her agonistion to contend for mastery and faith overcomes all alluring and fond temptations to sin and faith overcomes all our weaknesses and faintings in our troubles by the faith of the promises we learn to despise the world choosing those objects which faith discovers and by expectation of the same promises we are comforted in all our sorrows and enabled to look through and see beyond the cloud but the vigor of it is pressed and called forth when our fine discourses come to be reduced to practice for in our health and clearer days it is easy to talk of putting trust in god we readily trust him for life when we are in health for provisions when we have fair revenues and for deliverance when we are newly escaped but let us come to sit upon the margin of our grave and let a tyrant lean hard against our fortunes and dwell upon our wrong let the storm arise and the keels toss till the cordage crack or that all our hopes bulge under us and descend into the hollowness of sad misfortunes then can you believe when you neither hear nor see nor feel anything but objections this is the proper work of sickness faith is then brought into the theatre and so exercised that if it abides but to the end of the contention we may see the work of faith which god will hugely crown the same i say of hope and of charity of the love of god and of patience which is a grace produced from the mixtures of all these they are virtues which are greedy of danger and no man was ever honored by any wise or discerning person for dining upon persian carpets nor rewarded with a crown for being at ease it was the fire that did honor to mutius scevola poverty made fabricius famous rutilius was made excellent by banishment regulus by torments socrates by prison cato by his death and god hath crowned the memory of job with a wreath of glory because he sat upon his dunghill wisely and temperately and his potsherd and his groans mingled with praises and justifications of god pleased him like an anthem sung by angels in the morning of the resurrection god could not choose but be pleased with the delicious accents of martyrs when in their tortures they cried out nothing but holy jesus and blessed be god and they also themselves who with a hearty designation to the divine pleasure can delight in god's severe dispensation will have the transportations of cherubim when they enter into the joys of god if god be delicious to his servants when he smites them he will be nothing but ravishments and ecstasies to their spirits when he refreshes them with the overflowings of joy in the day of recompenses no man is more miserable than he that hath no adversity that man is not tried whether he be good or bad 
and God never crowns those virtues which are only faculties and dispositions, but every act of virtue is an ingredient into reward. And we see many children fairly planted, whose parts of nature were never dressed by art, nor called from the furrows of their first possibilities by discipline and institution, and they dwell for ever in ignorance, and converse with beasts. And yet, if they had been dressed and exercised, might have stood at the chairs of princes, or spoken parables amongst the rulers of cities. Our virtues are but in the seed when the grace of God comes upon us first. But this grace must be thrown into broken furrows, and must twice feel the cold, and twice feel the heat, and be softened with storms and showers, and then it will arise into fruitfulness and harvests. And what is there in the world to distinguish virtues from dishonors, or the valor of Caesar from the softness of the Egyptian eunuchs, or that can make anything rewardable, but the labor and the danger, the pain and the difficulty? Virtue could not be anything but sensuality, if it were the entertainment of our senses and fond desires, and Apicius had been the noblest of all the Romans, if feeding a great appetite and despising the severities of temperance, had been the work and proper employment of a wise man. But otherwise do fathers and otherwise do mothers handle their children. These soften them with kisses and imperfect noises, with the pap and breast milk of soft endearments. They rescue them from tutors, and snatch them from discipline. They desire to keep them fat and warm, and their feet dry and their bellies full. And then the children govern and cry, and prove fools and troublesome, so long as the feminine republic does endure. But fathers, because they design to have their children wise and valiant, apt for counsel, or tie them to study, to hard labor, and effective contingencies. They rejoice when the bold boy strikes a lion with his hunting spear, and shrinks not when the beast comes to affright his early courage. Softness is for slaves and beasts, for minstrels and useless persons, for such who cannot ascend higher than the state of a fair ox, or a servant entertained for vainer offices. But the man that designs his son for noble employments, to honors and to triumphs, to consular dignities and presidencies of councils, loves to see him pale with study, or panting with labor, burdened with sufferance, or eminent by dangers. And so God dresses us for heaven. He loves us struggling with a disease, and resisting the devil, and contesting against the weaknesses of nature, and against hope to believe in hope, resigning ourselves to God's will, praying him to choose for us, and dying in all things but faith and its blessed consequences. Ut ad officium cum pericule simpis prompti, and the danger and the resistance shall endear the office. For so have I known the boisterous north wind pass through the yielding air, which opened its bosom and appeased its violence by entertaining it with easy compliance in all the regions of its reception. But when the same breath of heaven hath been checked with the stiffness of a tower, or the united strength of wood, it grew mighty, and dwelt there, and made the highest branches stoop, and make a smooth path for it on the top of all its glories. So is sickness, and so is the grace of God. When sickness hath made the difficulty, then God's grace hath made a triumph, and by doubting its power hath created new proportions of a reward and then shows its biggest glory, when it hath the greatest difficulty to master, the greatest weaknesses to support, the most busy temptations to contest with. For so God loves that his strength should be seen in our weakness and our danger. Happy is that state of life in which our services to God are the dearest and the most expensive. Sickness hath some degrees of eligibility, at least by an after-choice, because to all persons which are within the possibilities and state of pardon, it becomes a great instrument of pardon of sins. For as God seldom rewards here and hereafter too, so it is not very often that he punishes in both states. In great and final sins he doth so, but we find it expressed only in the case of the sin against the Holy Ghost, quote, which shall never be forgiven in this world nor in the world to come, end quote that is, 
it shall be punished in both worlds and the infelicities of this world shall but usher in the intolerable calamities of the next but this is in a case of extremity and in sins of an unpardonable malice in those lesser stages of death which are deviations from the rule and not a destruction and perfect antimony to the whole institution god very often smites with his rod of sickness that he may not for ever be slaying the soul with eternal death Quote, I will visit their offences with the rod, and their sin with scourges. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my truth to fail. And there is in the New Testament a delivering over to Satan, and a consequent buffeting, for the mortification of the flesh indeed, but that the soul may be saved in the day of the Lord. And to some persons the utmost process of God's anger reaches but to a sharp sickness, or at most but to a temporal death and then the little momentary anger is spent and expires in rest and a quiet grave origen saint augustine and cassian say concerning ananias and sapphira that they were slain with a sudden death that by such a judgment their sin might be punished and their guilt expiated and their persons reserved for mercy in the day of judgment and god cuts off many of his children from the land of the living and yet when they are numbered amongst the dead he finds them in the book of life written amongst those that shall live to him for ever and thus it happened to many new christians in the church of corinth for their little indecencies and disorders in the circumstances of receiving the holy sacrament saint paul says that many amongst them were sick many were weak and some were fallen asleep he expresses the divine anger against those persons in no louder accents which is according to the style of the new testament where all the great transactions of duty and reproof are generally made upon the stock of heaven and hell is plainly a reserve and a period set to the declaration of god's wrath for god knows that the torments of hell are so horrid so insupportable a calamity that he is not easy and apt to cast those souls which he hath taken so much care and hath been at so much expense to save into the eternal never dying flames of hell lightly for small sins or after a fairly begun repentance and in the midst of holy desires to finish it but god takes such penalties and exacts such fines of us which we may pay salvo contenimento saving the main stake of all even our precious souls and therefore saint augustine prayed to god in his penitential sorrows hear o lord burn and cut my flesh that thou mayest spare me for ever for so said our blessed saviour every sacrifice must be burnt with fire that is we must abide in the state of grace and if we have committed sins we must expect to be put into the state of affliction and yet the sacrifice will send up a right and untroubled cloud and a sweet smell to join with the incense of the altar where the eternal priest offers a never-ceasing sacrifice and now i have said a thing against which there can be no exceptions and of which no just reason can make abatement for when sickness which is the condition of our nature is called for with purposes of redemption when we are sent to death to secure eternal life when god strikes us that he may spare us it shows that we have done things which he essentially hates and therefore we must be smitten with the rod of god but in the midst of judgment god remembers mercy and makes the rod to be medicinal and like the rod of god in the hand of aaron to shoot forth buds and leaves and almonds hopes and mercies and eternal recompenses in the day of restitution this is so great a good to us if it be well conducted in all the channels of its intention and design that if we had put off the objections of the flesh with abstractions contempts and separations so as we ought to do it were as earnestly to be prayed for as any gay blessing that crowns our cups with joy and our heads with garlands and forgetfulness but this was it which i said that this may nay that it ought to be chosen at least by an after election for so said st paul quote, if we judge ourselves we shall not be condemned of the lord quote. 
that is if we judge ourselves worthy of the sickness if we acknowledge and confess god's justice in smiting us if we take the rod of god in the infliction and then the sickness beginning and being managed in the virtue of repentance and patience and resignation and charity will end in peace and pardon and justification and consignation to glory that i have spoken truth i have brought god's spirit speaking in scripture for a witness but if this be true there are not many states of life that have advantages which can outweigh this great instrument of security to our final condition moses died at the mouth of the lord said the story he died with the kisses of the lord's mouth so the chaldee paraphrase it was the greatest he kissed him and he died but i have some things to observe for the better finishing this consideration one all these advantages and lessenings of evils in the state of sickness are only upon the stock of virtue and religion there is nothing can make sickness in any sense eligible or in many senses tolerable but only the grace of god that only turns sickness into easiness and felicity which also turns it into virtue for whosoever goes about to comfort a vicious person when he lies sick upon his bed can only discourse of the necessities of nature or the unavoidableness of the suffering of the accidental vexations and increase of torments by impatience of the fellowship of all the sons of adam and such other little considerations which indeed if sadly reflected upon and found to stand alone teach him nothing but the degree of his calamity and the evil of his condition and teach him such a patience and minister to him such a comfort which can only make him to observe decent gestures in his sickness and to converse with his friends and standers by so as may do them comfort and ease their funeral and civil complaints but do him no true advantage for all that may be spoken to a beast when he is crowned with hair laces and bound with fillets to the altar to bleed to death to appease the anger of the deity and to ease the burden of his relatives and indeed what comfort can he receive whose sickness as it looks back is an effect of god's indignation and fierce vengeance and if it goes forward and enters into the gates of the grave is the beginning of a sorrow that shall never have an ending but when the sickness is a messenger sent from a chastising father when it first turns into degrees of innocence and then into virtues and thence into pardon this is no misery but such a method of the divine economy and dispensation as resolves to bring us to heaven without any new impositions but merely upon the stock and charges of nature two let it be observed that these advantages which spring from sickness are not in all instances of virtue nor to all persons sickness is the proper scene for patience and resignation for all the passive graces of a christian for faith and hope and for some single acts of the love of god but sickness is not a fit station for a penitent and it can serve the ends of the grace of repentance but accidentally sickness may begin a repentance if god continues life and if we cooperate with the divine grace or sickness may help to alleviate the wrath of god and to facilitate the pardon if all the other parts of this duty be performed in our healthful state so that it may serve at the entrance in or at the going out but sickness at no hand is a good stage to represent all the substantial parts of this duty one it invites to it two it makes it appear necessary three it takes off the fancies of vanity four it attempters the spirit five it cures hypocrisy six it tames the fumes of pride seven it is the school of patience eight and by taking us from off the brisker relishes of the world it makes us with more gust to taste the things of the spirit and all this only when god fits the circumstances of the sickness so as to consist with acts of reason consideration choice and a present and reflecting mind which then god sends when he means that the sickness of the body should be the cure of the soul but let no man so rely upon it as by design to trust the beginning the progress and the consummation of our piety to such an estate 
which forever leaves it imperfect, and though to some persons it adds degrees, and ministers opportunities, and exercises single acts with great advantage, in passive graces, yet it is never an entire or sufficient instrument for the change of our condition from the state of death to the liberty and life of the sons of God. 3. It were good if we could transact the affairs of our souls with nobleness and ingenuity, and that we would, by an early and forward religion, prevent the necessary arts of the divine providence. It is true that God cures some by incision, by fire, and torments, but these are ever the more obstinate and more unrelentant natures. God's providence is not so afflictive and full of trouble as that it hath placed sickness and infirmity amongst things simply necessary, and, in most persons, it is but a sickly and an effeminate virtue, which is imprinted upon our spirits with fears and the sorrows of a fever or a peevish consumption. It is but a miserable remedy to be beholden to a sickness for our health, and though it be better to suffer the loss of a finger than that the arm and the whole body should putrefy, yet even then also it is a trouble and an evil to lose a finger. He that mends with sickness pairs the nails of the beast when they have already torn off part of the flesh, but he that would have a sickness become a clear and an entire blessing, a thing indeed to be reckoned among the good things of God and the evil things of the world, must lead a holy life, and judge himself with an early sentence, and so order the affairs of his soul, that in the usual method of God's saving us, there may be nothing left to be done, but that such virtues should be exercised which God intends to crown, and then, as when the Athenians upon the day of battle, with longing and uncertain souls sitting in their common hall, expecting what would be the sentence of the day, at last received a messenger who only had breath enough left him to say, We are conquerors, and so died, so shall the sick person, who hath fought a good fight and kept the faith, and only awaits for his dissolution and his sentence, breathe forth his spirit with the accents of a conqueror, and his sickness and his death shall only make the mercy and the virtue more illustrious. But for the sickness itself, if all the calumnies were true concerning it, with which it is aspersed, yet it is far to be preferred before the most pleasant sin, and before a great secular business and a temporal care, and some men wake as much in the foldings of the sophist beds as others on the cross, and sometimes the very weight of sorrow and the weariness of a sickness press the spirit into slumbers and the images of rest, when the intemperate or the lustful person rolls upon his uneasy thorns, and sleep is departed from his eyes. Certain it is, some sickness is a blessing. Indeed, blindness were a most accursed thing, if no man were ever blind but he whose eyes were pulled out with tortures or burning basins. And if sickness were always a testimony of God's anger, and a violence to a man's whole condition, then it were a huge calamity." but because God sends it to his servants, to his children, to little infants, to apostles and saints, with designs of mercy to preserve their innocence, to overcome temptation, to try their virtue, to fit them for rewards, it is certain that sickness never is an evil but by our own faults, and if we will do our duty, we shall be sure to turn it into a blessing. If the sickness be great, it may end in death, and the greater it is, the sooner. And if it be very little, it hath great intervals of rest. If it be between both, we may be masters of it, and by serving the ends of providence, serve also the perfective end of human nature, and enter into the possession of everlasting mercies. The sum is this. He that is afraid of pain is afraid of his own nature, and if his fear be violent, it is a sign his patience is none at all, and an impatient person is not ready dressed for heaven. None but suffering, humble, and patient persons can go to heaven, and when God hath given us the whole stage of our life to exercise all the active virtues of religion, it is necessary in the state of virtues that some portion and period of our lives be assigned to passive graces, 
for patience for christian fortitude for resignation or conformity to the divine will but as the violent fear of sickness makes us impatient so it will make our death without comfort and without religion and we shall go off from our stage of actions and sufferings with an unhandsome exit because we were willing to receive the kindness of god when he expressed it as we listed but we would not suffer him to be king and gracious to us in his own method nor were willing to exercise and improve our virtues at the charge of a sharp fever or a lingering consumption Quote, woe be to the man that hath lost patience for what will he do when the lord shall visit him End of section 15Section 16 of the Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deanna, www.deannadaily.com. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Chapter 3, Section 7. The second temptation, proper to the state of sickness, fear of death, with its remedies. There is nothing which can make sickness unsanctified, but the same also will give us cause to fear death. If, therefore, we so order our affairs and spirits that we do not fear death, our sickness may easily become our advantage, and we can then receive counsel, and consider, and do those acts of virtue which are, in that state, the proper services of God and such which men in bondage and fear are not capable of doing, or of advises how they should, when they come to the appointed days of mourning. And indeed, if men would but place their design of being happy in the nobleness, courage, and perfect resolutions of doing handsome things, and passing through our unavoidable necessities in the contempt and despite of the things of this world, and in holy living and the perfective desires of our natures, the longings and pursuances after heaven, it is certain they could not be made miserable by chance and change, by sickness and death. But we are so softened and made effeminate with delicate thoughts and meditations of ease and brutish satisfactions that if our death come before we have seized upon a great fortune or enjoy the promises of the fortune tellers, we esteem ourselves to be robbed of our goods, to be mocked and miserable. Hence it comes that men are impatient of the thoughts of death. Hence come those arts of protraction and delaying the significations of old age, thinking to deceive the world, men cause in themselves, and by representing themselves youthfully they certainly continue their vanity, till Proserpina pull the peruke from their heads. We cannot deceive God and nature, for a coffin is a coffin, though it be covered with a pompous veil, and the minutes of our time strike on, and are counted by angels, till the period comes which must cause the passing bell to give warning to all the neighbors that thou art dead and they must be so, and nothing can excuse or retard this. And if our death could be put off a little longer, what advantage can it be, in thy accounts of nature or felicity? They that three hundred years agone died unwillingly, and stopped death two days, or stated a week, what is their gain? Where is that week? And poor spirited men use arts of protraction, and make their persons pitiable, but their condition contemptible, being like the poor sinners at Noah's flood, the waters drove them out of their lower rooms, then they crept up to the roof, having lasted half a day longer, and then they knew not how to get down. Some crept upon the top branch of a tree, and some climbed up to a mountain and stayed it may be three days longer, but all that while they entered a worse torment than death. They lived with amazement, and were distracted with the ruins of mankind, and the horror of a universal deluge. Remedies Against the Fear of Death By Way of Consideration God having in this world placed us in a sea, and troubled the sea with a continual storm, hath appointed the church for a ship, and religion to be the stern, but there is no haven or port but death. Death is that harbor, whither God hath designed every one, that there he may find rest from the troubles of the world. How many of the noblest Romans have taken death for sanctuary, and have esteemed it less than shame or a mean dishonor? And Caesar was cruel to Domitius, captain of Corfinium, when he had taken the town from him that he refused to sign his petition of death. Death would have hid his head with honor, 
but that cruel mercy reserved him to the shame of surviving his disgrace. The Holy Scripture, giving an account of the reason of the divine providence taking godly men from this world and shutting them up in a hasty grave, says that they are taken away from the evils to come, and concerning ourselves it is certain, if we had ten years agone taken seizure of our portion of dust, death had not taken us from good things but from infinite evils, such which the sun hath seldom seen. Did not Priamus weep oftener that Troilus, and happy had he been if he had died when his sons were living, and his kingdom safe, and houses full, and his city unburnt? It was a long life that made him miserable, and an early death only could have secured his fortune. And it hath happened many times that persons of a fair life and a clear reputation of a good fortune and an honorable name have been tempted in their age to folly and vanity, have fallen under the disgrace of dotage, or into an unfortunate marriage, or have besotted themselves with drinking, or outlived their fortunes, or become tedious to their friends, or are afflicted with lingering and vexatious diseases, or live to see their excellent parts buried, and cannot understand the wise discourses and productions of their younger years. In all these cases, and infinite more, do not all the world say that it had been better this man had died sooner? But so have I known passionate women to shriek aloud when their nearest relatives were dying, and that horrid shriek hath stayed the spirit of the man a while to wonder at the folly, and represent the inconvenience, and the dying person hath lived one day longer full of pain amazed with an indeterminate spirit, distorted with convulsions, and only come again to act one scene more of a new calamity, and to die with less decency. So also do very many men, with passion and a troubled interest they strive to continue their life longer, and it may be they escape this sickness, and live to fall into disgrace. They escape the storm, and fall into the hands of pirates, and instead of dying with liberty they live like slaves, miserable and despised servants, to a little time, and sottish admirers of the breath of their own lungs. Paulus Aemilius did handsomely reprove the cowardice of the king of humanity, that having conquered him and taken his kingdom from him, he would be content with that, and not lead him in triumph of prisoner to Rome. Aemilius told him he need not be beholden to him for that, himself might prevent that in despite of him, but the timorous king durst not die. But certainly every wise man will easily believe that it had been better the Macedonian kings should have died in battle than protract their life so long, till some of them came to be scriveners and joiners at Rome, or that the tyrant of Sicily better had perished in the Adriatic than be wafted to Corinth safely and there turned schoolmaster. It is a sad calamity that the fear of death shall so imbecile man's courage and understanding that he dares not suffer the remedy of all his calamities, but that he lives to say, as Liberius did, I have lived this one day longer than I should. Either, therefore, let us be willing to die when God calls, or let us never more complain of the calamities of our life, which we feel so sharp and numerous. And when God sends his angel to us with the scroll of death, let us look on it as an act of mercy to prevent many sins and many calamities of a longer life, and lay our heads down softly, and go to sleep without wrangling like babies and forward children. For a man, at least, get this by his death, that his calamities are not immortal. But I do not only consider death by the advantages of comparison, but if we look on it in itself, it is no such formidable thing, if we view it on both sides and handle it, and consider all its appendages. It is necessary, and therefore not intolerable, and nothing is to be esteemed evil which God and nature have fixed with eternal sanctions. It is a law of God, it is a punishment of our sins, and it is the constitution of our nature. Two differing substances were joined together with the breath of God, and when that breath is taken away, they part asunder, and return to their several principles, the soul to God our Father, the body to the earth our mother. And what in all this is evil? Surely nothing, but that we are men, nothing, but that we are not born immortal. But by declining this change with great passion, or receiving it with a huge natural fear, we accuse the divine providence of tyranny, and exclaim against our natural constitution, and our discontent that we are men. It is a thing that is no great matter in itself, if we consider that we die daily, that it meets us in every accident, that every creature carries a dart along with it, and can kill us. And therefore, when Lysimachus threatened Theodorus to kill him, he told him that it was so great matter to do, and he could do no more than the Cantharides could, 
a little fly could do as much. It is a thing that everyone suffers, even persons of the lowest resolution, of the meanest virtue, of no breeding, of no discourse. Take away but the pomps of death, the disguises and solemn bugbears, the tinsel and the actings by candlelight, and proper and fantastic ceremonies, the minstrels and the noisemakers, the women and the weepers, the swoonings and the shriekings, the nurses and the physicians, the dark room and the ministers, the kindred and the watchers. And then to die is easy, ready, and quitted from its troublesome circumstances. It is the same harmless thing that a poor shepherd suffered yesterday, or a maidservant today. And at the same time in which you die, in that very night a thousand creatures die with you, some wise men and many fools, and the wisdom of the first will not quit him, and the folly of the latter does not make him unable to die. Of all the evils in the world which are reproached with an evil character, death is the most innocent of its accusation. For when it is present, it hurts nobody, and when it is absent, it is indeed troublesome, for the trouble is owning to our fears, not to the affrighting and mistaken object. And besides this, if it were an evil, it is so transient that it passes like the instant or undiscerned portion of the present time, and either it is past, or it is not yet. For just when it is, no man hath reason to complain of so insensible, so sudden, so undiscerned a change. It is so harmless a thing, that no good man was ever thought the more miserable for dying, but much the happier. When men saw the graves of Calatinus, of the Servilii, the Scipios, the Metli, did ever any man among the wisest Romans think them unhappy? And when St. Paul fell under the sword of Nero, and St. Peter died upon the cross, and St. Stephen from a heap of stones was carried into an easier grave, they that made great lamentation over them wept for their own interest, and after the manner of men. But the martyrs were accounted happy, and their days kept solemnly, and their memories preserved in never-dying honors. When St. Hilary, Bishop of Poitiers in France, went into the East to reprove the Arian heresy, he heard that a young, noble gentleman treated with his daughter Abra for marriage. The bishop wrote to his daughter that she should not engage her promise, nor do countenance to that request, because he had provided for her a husband fair, rich, wise, and noble, far beyond her present offer. The event of which was this, she obeyed, and when her father returned from his eastern triumph to his western charge, he prayed to God that his daughter might die quickly, and God heard his prayers, and Christ took her into his bosom, entertaining with antipasts and caresses of holy love, till the day of the marriage supper of the Lamb shall come. But when the bishop's wife observed this event, and understood of the good man her husband what was done, and why, she never let him alone till he obtained the same favor for her, and she also, at the prayers of St. Hilary, went into a more early grave and a bed of joys. It is a sottish and unlearned thing to reckon the time of our life, as it is short or long, to be good or evil fortune, life in itself being neither good nor bad, but just as we make it, and therefore so is death. But when we consider death is not only better than a miserable life, not only an easy and innocent thing in itself, but also that it is a state of advantage, we shall have reason not to double the sharpnesses of our sickness by our fear of death. Certain it is, death hath some good upon its proper stock, praise and a fair memory, a reverence and religion towards them so great that it is counted dishonest to speak evil of the dead. Then they rest in peace, and are quiet from their labors, and are designed to immortality. Cleobus and Beton, Trophonius and Agamedes, had an early death sent them as a reward, to the former for their piety to their mother, to the latter for the building of a temple. To this all those arguments will minister which relate the advantages of the state of separation and resurrection. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deanna, www.deannadaily.com. The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Chapter 3, Section 8. Remedies Against Fear of Death by Way of Exercise 
He that would willingly be fearless of death must learn to despise the world. He must neither love anything passionately, nor be proud of any circumstance in his life. O oh, death, how bitter is the remembrance of thee to a man that liveth at rest in his possessions, to a man that hath nothing to vex him, and that hath prosperity in all things, yea, unto him that is yet able to receive meat, said the son of Sirach. But the parts of this exercise help each other. If a man be not incorporated in all his passions to the things of this world, he will less fear to be divorced from them than a supervening death. And yet, because he must part with them all in death, it is but reasonable he should not be passionate for so fugitive and transient interest. But if any man thinks well of himself for being a handsome person, or if he be stronger and wiser than his neighbors, he must remember that what he boasts of will decline into weakness and dishonor. But that very boasting and complacency will make death keener and more unwelcome, because it comes to take him from his confidence and pleasures, making his beauty equal to those ladies that have slept some years in charnel houses, and their strength not so stubborn as the breath of an infant, and their wisdom such which can be looked for in the land where all things are forgotten. He that would not fear death must strengthen his spirits with the proper instruments of Christian fortitude. All men are resolved upon this, that to bear grief honestly and temperately, and to die willingly and nobly, is the duty of a good and valiant man, and they that are not so are vicious and fools and cowards. All men praise the valiant and honest, and that which the very heathen admired in their noblest examples is especially patience and contempt of death. Zeno Elietes endured torments rather than discover his friends, or betray them to the danger of the tyrant. And Colanus, the barbarous and unlearned Indian, willingly suffered himself to be burnt alive, and all the women did so, to do honor to their husband's funeral, and to represent and prove their affections great to their lords. The religion of a Christian does more command fortitude than ever did any institution, for we are commanded to be willing to die for Christ, to die for the brethren, to die rather than to give offense or scandal. The effect of which is this that he that is instructed to do the necessary parts of his duty is, by the same instrument, fortified against death, and he that does his duty need not fear death, so neither shall he. The parts of his duty are parts of his security. It is certainly a great baseness and pusillanimity of spirit that makes death terrible and extremely to be avoided. Christian prudence is a great security against the fear of death. For if we be afraid of death, it is but reasonable to use all spiritual arts to take off the apprehension of the evil. But therefore we ought to remove our fear, because fear gives to death wings, and spurs, and darts. Death hastens to a fearful man, if therefore you would make death harmless and slow, to throw off fear is the way to do it, and prayer is the way to do that. If therefore you be afraid of death, consider you will have less need to fear it by how much the less you do fear it and so cure your direct fear by a reflex act of prudence and consideration. Phanius had not died so soon if he had not feared death, and when Gnaeus Carbo begged the respite of a little time for a base employment of the soldiers of Pompey he got nothing but that the baseness of his fear dishonored the dignity of his third consulship, and he chose to die in a place where none but his meanest servants should have seen him. I remember a story of the wrestler Polydamus that, running into a cave to avoid the storm, the water at last swelled so high that it began to press that hollowness to a ruin, which, when his fellows espied, they chose to enter into the common fate of all men, and went abroad, but Polydamus thought by his strength to support the earth, till its intolerable weight crushed him into flatness and a grave. Many men run for shelter to a place, and they only find a remedy for their fears by feeling the worst of evils. Fear itself finds no sanctuary but the worst of sufferance. And they that fly from a battle are exposed to the mercy and fury of the pursuers, who, if they faced about, were as well disposed to give laws of life and death as to take them, and at worst can but die nobly. But now, even at the very best, they live shamefully, or die timorously. Courage is the greatest security, for it does most commonly safeguard the man, but always rescues the condition from an intolerable evil. If thou wilt be fearless of death, endeavor to be in love with the felicities of saints and angels, and be once persuaded to believe that there is a condition of living better than this, that there are creatures more noble than we, 
that above there is a country better than ours, that the inhabitants know more and know better, and are in places of rest and desire, and first learn to value it, and then learn to purchase it, and death cannot be a formidable thing, which lets us into so much joy and so much felicity. And indeed, who would not think his condition mended if he passed from conversing with dull tyrants and enemies of learning, to converse with Homer and Plato, with Socrates and Cicero, with Plutarch and Fabricius. So the heathen speculated, but we consider higher. The dead that die in the Lord shall converse with St. Paul, and all the college of the apostles, and all the saints and martyrs, with all the good men whose memory we preserve in honor, with excellent kings and holy bishops, and with the great shepherd and bishop of our souls, Jesus Christ, and with God himself. For Christ died for us, that whether we wake or sleep we might live together with him. Then we shall be free from lust and envy, from fear and rage, from covetousness and sorrow, from tears and cowardice. And these, indeed, properly, are the only evils that are contrary to felicity and wisdom. Then we shall see strange things, and know new propositions, and all things in another manner and to higher purposes. Cleombrotus was so taken with this speculation that, having learned from Plato's Phaedon the soul's abode, he had not patience to stay nature's dull leisure but leapt from a wall to his portion of immortality. And when Pomponius Atticus resolved to die by famine to ease the great pains of his gout, in the abstinence of two days he found his foot at ease. But when he began to feel the pleasures of an approaching death, and the delicacies of that ease he was to inherit below, he would not withdraw his foot, but went on and finished his death and so did Cleopthes, and every wise man will despise the little evils of that state, which is indeed the daughter of fear, but the mother of rest and peace and felicity. If God should say to us, Cast thyself into the sea, as Christ did to St. Peter, or as God concerning Jonas, I have provided for thee a dolphin, or a whale, or a port, a safety, or a deliverance, security, or a reward, were we not incredulous and pusillanimous persons if we should tremble to put such a felicity into act, and ourselves into possession? The very duty of resignation and the love of our own interest are good antidotes against fear. In forty or fifty years we find evils enough, and arguments enough, to make us weary of this life. And to a good man there are very many more reasons to be afraid of life than death, this having in it less of evil and more of advantage. And it was a rare wish of that Roman that death might come only to wise and excellent persons, and not to fools and cowards, that it might not be a sanctuary for the timorous, but the reward of the virtuous, and indeed they only can make advantage of it. Make no excuses to make thy desires of life seem reasonable. Neither cover thy fear with pretenses, but suppose it rather with arts of severity and ingenuity. Some are not willing to submit to God's sentence and arrest of death till they have finished such a design, or made an end of the last paragraph of their book, or raised such portions for their children, or preached so many sermons, or built their house, or planted their orchard, or ordered their estate with such advantages. It is well for the modesty of these men that the excuse is ready, but if it were not, it is certain they would search one out, for an idle man is never ready to die, and is glad of any excuse and a busied man hath always something unfinished, and he is ready for everything but death. And I remember that Petronius brings in Eumolpus, composing verses in a desperate storm, and being called upon to shift for himself when the ship dashed upon the rock, cried out to let him alone until he had trimmed and finished his verse, which was lame in the hinder leg. The man either had too strong a desire to end his verse, or too great a desire not to end his life. But we must know God's times are not to be measured by our circumstances, and what I value God regards not. Or if it be valuable in the accounts of men, yet God will supply it with other contingencies of his providence. And if Epaphroditus had died when he had his great sickness St. Paul speaks of, God would have secured the work of the gospel without him. And he could have spared Epaphroditus as well as St. Stephen, and St. Peter as well as St. James. Say no more, but when God calls, lay aside thy papers, and first dress thy soul, and then dress thy hearse. Blindness is odious, and widowhood is sad, and destitution is without comfort, and persecution is full of trouble, and famine is intolerable, and tears are the sad ease of a sadder heart. But these are evils of our life, not of our death. 
For the dead that die in the Lord are so far from wanting the commodities of this life that they do not want life itself. After all this, I do not say it is a sin to be afraid of death. We find the boldest spirit that discourses of it with confidence, and dares undertake a danger as big as death, yet doth shrink at the horror of it when it comes dressed in its proper circumstances. And Brutus, who was as bold a Roman to undertake a noble action as any was since they first reckoned by consuls, yet when Furius came to cut his throat after his defeat by Anthony, he ran from it like a girl, and being admonished to die constantly, he swore by his life that he would shortly endure death. But what do I speak of such imperfect persons? Our blessed Lord was pleased to legitimate fear to us by his agony and prayers in the garden. It is not a sin to be afraid, but it is a great felicity to be with fear, which felicity our dearest Saviour refused to have because it was agreeable to his purposes to suffer anything that was contrary to felicity, everything but sin. But when men will by all means avoid death, they are like those who at any hand resolve to be rich. The case may happen in which they will blaspheme and dishonor providence, or do a base action, or curse God and die, but in all cases they die miserable and ensnared, and in no case do they die the less for it. Nature hath left us the key of the churchyard, and custom hath brought cemeteries and charnel houses into cities and churches, places most frequented, that we might not carry ourselves strangely in so certain, so expected, so ordinary, so unavoidable an accident. All reluctancy or unwillingness to obey the divine decree is but a snare to ourselves and a load to our spirits, and is either an entire cause or a great aggravation of the calamity. Who did not scorn to look upon Xerxes when he caused three hundred stripes to be given to the sea, and sent a chartel of defiance against the mountains of Athos? We did not scorn the proud vanity of Cyrus when he took so goodly a revenge upon the river Sindus for his hard passage over it? or did not deride or pity the Thracians for shooting arrows against heaven when it thunders? To be angry with God, to quarrel with the divine providence, by repining against an unalterable, a natural, an easy sentence, is an argument of a huge folly, and the parent of a great trouble. A man is base and foolish to no purpose. He throws away a vice to his own misery, and to no advantages of ease and pleasure. Fear keeps men in bondage all their life, saith St. Paul and patience makes him his own man, and lord of his own interest and person. Therefore possess yourselves in patience, with reason and religion, and you shall die with ease. If all the parts of this discourse be true, if they be better than dreams, and, unless virtue be nothing but words, as a grove is a heap of trees, if they be not the phantasms of hypochondriacal persons, and designs upon the interest of men, and their persuasions to evil purpose, then there is no reason but that we should really desire death, and account it among the good things of God, and the sour and laborious felicities of man. St. Paul understood it well when he desired to be dissolved. He well enough knew his own advantages, and pursued them accordingly. But it is certain that he that is afraid of death, I mean with a violent and transporting fear, with a fear apt to discompose his duty or his patience, that man either loves this world too much, or dares not trust God for the next. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deanna www.dianadaily.com The Rule and Exercises of Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor Chapter 3, Section 9 General Rules and Exercises Whereby Our Sickness May Become Safe and Sanctified Take care that the cause of thy sickness be such as may not sour it in the principal causes of it. It is a sad calamity to pass into the house of mourning through the gates of intemperance by a drunken meeting, or the surfeits of a loathed and luxurious table. For then a man suffers the pain of his own folly, and he is like a fool smarting under the whip which his own viciousness twisted for his back. Then a man pays the price of his sin, and hath a pure and an unmingled sorrow in his suffering, and it cannot be alleviated by any circumstances, for the whole affair is mere process of death and sorrow. 
sin is in the head, sickness is in the body, and death and eternity of pains in the tail. And nothing can make this condition tolerable unless the miracles of the divine mercy will be pleased to exchange the eternal anger for the temporal. True it is that in all sufferings the cause of it makes it noble or innoble, honor or shame, tolerable or intolerable. For when patience is assaulted by a ruder violence, by a blow from heaven or earth, from a gracious God or an unjust man, patience looks forth to the doors, which way she may escape. And if innocence or a cause of religion keep the first entrance, then, whether she escapes at the gates of life or death, there is a good to be received greater than the evils of a sickness. But if sin thrust in that sickness, and that hell stands at the door, then patience turns into fury, and seeing it impossible to go forth with safety, rolls up and down with a circular and infinite revolution, making its motion not from, but upon, its own center. It doubles the pain and increases the sorrow, till by its weight it breaks the spirit and bursts into the agonies of infinite and eternal ages. If we had seen St. Polycarp burned to death, or St. Lawrence roasted upon his gridiron, or St. Ignatius exposed to lions, or St. Sebastian pierced with arrows, or St. Atalus carried about the theater with scorn unto his death, for the cause of Jesus, for religion, for God, and a holy conscience, we should have been in love with flames, and have thought the gridiron fairer than the sponde, the ribs of a marital bed, and we should have chosen to converse with those beasts, rather than those men that brought those beasts forth, and estimated the arrows to be rays of light brighter than the moon, and that disgrace and mistaken pageantry were a solemnity richer and more magnificent than Mordicia's procession upon the king's horse, and in the robes of majesty. For so did these holy men account them. They kissed their stakes, and hugged their deaths, and ran violently to torments, and counted whippings and secular disgraces to be the enamel of their persons, and the anointment of their heads, and the embalming their names, and securing them for immortality. But to see said Janus torn in pieces by the people, or Nero crying and creeping timorously to his death, when he was condemned to die more majorum, to see Judas pale and trembling, full of anguish, sorrow, and despair, to observe the groanings and intolerable agonies of Herod and Antiochus, will tell and demonstrate the causes of patience and impatience to proceed from the causes of the suffering. And it is sin only that makes the cup bitter and deadly. When men, by vomiting, measure up the drink they took in, and sick and sad do again taste their meat turned into choler by intemperance, the sin and its punishment are mingled so that shame covers the face and sorrow puts a veil of darkness upon the heart, and we scarce pity a vile person that is hailed to execution for murder or for treason, but we say he deserves it, and that every man is concerned in it that he should die. If lust brought the sickness or the shame, if we truly suffer the rewards of our evil deeds, we must thank ourselves. That is, we are fallen into an evil condition, and are the sacrifice of the divine justice. But if we live holy lives, and if we enter well in, we are sure to pass on safe, and to go forth with advantage if we list ourselves. To this relates that we should not counterfeit sickness. For he that is to be careful of his passage into a sickness will think himself concerned that he fall not into it through a trap-door. For so it hath sometimes happened that such counterfeiting to light and evil purposes hath ended in a real sufferance. Appian tells of a Roman gentleman who, to escape the prescription of the triumvirate, fled, and to secure his privacy counterfeited himself blind on one eye, and wore a plaster upon it, till, beginning to be free from the malice of the three prevailing princes, he opened his hood, but could not open his eye, but forever lost the use of it, and with his eye paid for his liberty and hypocrisy. And Calius counterfeited the gout, and all its circumstances and pains, its dressings and arts of remedy and complaint, till at last the gout really entered, and spoiled the pageantry. His arts of dissimulation were so witty that they put life and motion into the very image of the disease. He made the very picture to sigh and groan. It is easy to tell upon the interest of what virtue such counterfeiting is to be reproved, but it will be harder to snatch the politics of the world from following that which they call a canonized and authentic precedent. And David's counterfeiting himself mad before the king of Gath, to save his life and liberty, will be sufficient to entice men to serve an end upon the stock and charges of so small an irregularity, 
not in the matter of manners, but in the rules and decencies of natural or civil deportment. I cannot certainly tell what degrees of excuse David's action might put on. This only, besides his present necessity, the laws whose coercive and directive power David lived under had less of severity and more of liberty, and towards enemies had so little of restraint and so great a power, that what amongst them was a direct sin, if used to their brethren the sons of Jacob, was lawful and permitted to be acted against enemies. To which also I add this general caution, that the actions of holy persons in Scripture are not always good precedents to us Christians, who are to walk by a rule and a greater strictness, with more simplicity and hardiness of pursuit. And amongst them sanctity and holy living did, in very many of its instances, increase in new particulars of duty, and the prophets reproved many things which the law forbade not, and taught many duties which Moses prescribed not. And as the time of Christ's approach came, so the sermons and revelations too were more evangelical, and like the patterns which were fully to be exhibited by the Son of God, amongst which it is certain that Christian simplicity and godly sincerity are to be accounted, and counterfeiting of sickness is a huge enemy to this. It is an upbraiding the divine providence, a jesting with fire, a playing with a thunderbolt, a making the decrees of God to serve the vicious or secular ends of men. It is a tempting of a judgment, a false accusation of God, a forestalling and antedating his anger. It is a cozening of men by making God a party in the fraud, and therefore, if the cozenage returns upon the man's own head, he enters like a fox into his sickness, and perceives himself catched in a trap or erst in the intolerable dangers of the grave. Although we must be infinitely careful to prevent it, that sin does not thrust us into a sickness, yet when we are in the house of sorrow, we should do well to take physic against sin, and suppose that it is the cause of the evil, if not by way of natural causality and proper effect, yet by amoral influence and by a just demerit. We can easily see when a man hath got a surfeit, and temperance is as plain as the handwriting upon the wall and easier to be read, but covetousness may cause a fever as well as drunkenness, and pride can produce a falling sickness as well as long washings and dilutions of the brain, and intemperate lust, and we find it recorded in scripture that the contemptuous and unprepared manner of receiving the holy sacraments caused sickness and death, and sacrilege and vow breach in Ananias and Sapphira made them to descend quick into their graves. Therefore, when sickness is upon us, let us cast about, and, if we can, let us find out the cause of God's displeasure, that, it being removed, we may return into the health and securities of God's loving kindness. Thus, in the three years' famine, David inquired of the Lord what was the matter, and God answered, It is for Saul and his bloody house. And then David expiated the guilt, and the people were full again of food and blessing. And when Israel was smitten by the Amorites, Joshua cast about and found out the accursed thing and cast it out, and the people after that fought prosperously. And what God in that case said to Joshua, he will also verify to us. I will not be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. But in pursuant of this, we are to observe that although in case of loud and clamorous sins, the discovery is easy and the remedy not difficult, yet because Christianity is a nice thing, and religion is as pure as the sun, and the soul of man is apt to be troubled from more principles than the intricate and curiously composed body in its innumerable parts, it will often happen that if we go to inquire into the particular we shall never find it out, and we may suspect drunkenness when it may be also a morose delectation in unclean thoughts, or covetousness, or oppression, or a crafty invasion of my neighbor's rights, or my want of charity, or my judging unjustly in my own cause, or my censuring my neighbors, or a secret pride, or a base hypocrisy, or the pursuance of little ends with violence and passion, that they may have procured the present messenger of death. Therefore, ask no more after any one, but heartily endeavor to reform all. Sin no more, lest a worst thing happen, for a single search or accusation may be the design of an imperfect repentance. But no man does heartily return to God, but he that decrees against every irregularity, and then only we can be restored to health or life, when we have taken away the causes of sickness and a cursed death. He that means to have his sickness turned into safety and life, into health and virtue, must make religion the employment of his sickness, and prayer the employment of his religion. For there are certain compendiums or abbreviatures and shortenings of religion fitted to several states that they first give up their names to Christ, and that turned from paganism to Christianity had an abbreviature fitted for them.
they were to renounce their false worshipings and give up their belief and vow their obedience unto Christ, and in the very profession of this they were forgiven in baptism. For God hastens to snatch them from the power of the devil, and therefore shortens the passage and secures the estate. In the case of poverty, God hath reduced this duty of man to an abbreviature of those few graces which they can exercise, such as are patience, contentedness, truth, and diligence, and the rest he accepts in good will, and the charities of the soul, in prayers, and the actions of a cheap religion. And to most men charity is also an abbreviature. And as the love of God shortens the way to the purchase of all virtues, so the expression of this to the poor goes a huge way in the requisites and toward the consummation of an excellent religion. And martyrdom is another abbreviature, and so is every act of an excellent and heroical virtue. But when we are fallen into the state of sickness, and that our understanding is weak and troubled, our bodies sick and useless, our passions turned into fear, and the whole state into suffering, God, in compliance with man's infirmity, hath also turned our religion into such a duty which a sick man can do most passionately, and a sad man and a timorous can perform effectually, and a dying man can do to many purposes of pardon and mercy, and that is prayer. For although a sick man is bound to do many acts of virtue of several kinds, yet the most of them are to be done in the way of prayer. Prayer is not only the religion that is proper to a sick man's condition, but it is the manner of doing other graces, which is then left and in his power. For thus the sick man is to do his repentance and his mortifications, his temperance and his chastity, by a fiction of imagination, bringing the offers of the virtue to the spirit, and making an action of election. And so our prayers are a direct act of chastity, when they are made in that matter of grace. Just as repentance for our cruelty is an act of the grace of mercy, and repentance for uncleanness is an act of chastity, is a means of its purchase, an act in order to the habit. And though such acts of virtue, which are only in the way of prayer, are ineffective to the entire purchase, and of themselves cannot change the vice into virtue, yet they are good renewings of the grace, and proper exercise of a habit already gotten. The purpose of this discourse is to present the excellency of prayer, and its proper advantages which it hath in the time of sickness. For besides that it moves God to pity, piercing the clouds and making the heavens like a pricked eye to weep over us and refresh us with showers of pity, it also doth the work of the soul, and expresses the virtue of his whole life in effigy, in pictures and lively representments, so preparing it for a never-ceasing crown, by renewing the actions in the continuation of a never-ceasing and never-hindered affection. Prayer speaks to God when the tongue is stiffened with the approachings of death. Prayer can dwell in the heart, and be signified by the hand or eye, by a thought or a groan. Prayer of all the actions of religion is the last alive, and it serves God without circumstances, and exercises material graces by abstraction from matter, and separation, and makes them to be spiritual, and therefore best dresses our bodies for funeral or recovery, for the mercies of restitution or the mercies of the grave. In every sickness, whether it will or will not be so in nature and in the event, yet in thy spirit and preparations resolve upon it, and treat thyself accordingly, as if it were a sickness unto death. For many men support their unequal courages by flattery and false hopes, and because sicker men have recovered believe that they shall do so, but therefore they neglect to adorn their souls, or set their house in order. Besides the temporal inconveniences that often happen by such persuasions and putting off the evil day, such as our dying into state, leaving estates entangled and some relatives unprovided for, they suffer infinitely in the interest and affairs of their soul. They die carelessly and surprised, their burdens on and their scruples unremoved, and their cases of conscience not determined, and, like a sheep, without any care taken concerning their precious souls. Some men will never believe that a villain will betray them, though they receive often advices from suspicious persons, and likely accidents, till they are entered into the snare, and then they cannot return. But so the treason entered, and the man was betrayed by his own folly, placing the snare in the regions and advantages of opportunity. This evil looks like boldness and a confident spirit, but it is the greatest timorousness and cowardice in the world. They are so fearful to die that they dare not look upon it as possible and think that the making of a will is a mortal sign, and sending for a spiritual man an irrecoverable disease, and they are so afraid lest they should think and believe now they must die, that they will not take care that it may not be evil in case they should. So did the eastern slaves drink wine, and wrapped their heads in a veil, that they might die without sense or sorrow, and wink hard that they might sleep the easier. 
in pursuance of this ruin let a man consider that whatsoever must be done in sickness ought to be done in health only let him observe that his sickness as a good monitor chastises his neglect of duty and forces him to live as he always should and then all these solemnities and dressings for death are nothing else but the part of a religious life which he ought to have exercised all his days and if those circumstances can affright him let him please his fancy by this truth that then he does but begin to live but it will be a huge folly if he shall think that confession of his sins will kill him or receiving the holy sacrament will hasten his agony or the priest shall undo all the hopeful language and promises of his physician assure thyself thou canst not die the sooner but by such addresses thou may diest much the better let the sick person be infinitely careful that he do not fall into a state of death upon a new account that is at no hand commit a deliberate sin or retain any affection to the old for in both cases he falls into the evils of a surprise and the horrors of a sudden death for a sudden death is but a sudden joy if it takes a man in the state and exercises a virtue and it is only then an evil when it finds a man unready they were sad departures when tigillinus cornelius gallus the praetor Louis, the son of Gonzaga, Duke of Mantua, Ladislaus, King of Naples, Speusippus, Giacetius of Geneva, and one of the popes, died in the forbidden embraces of abused women. Or if Job had cursed God, and so died? Or when a man sits down in despair, and in the accusation and calumny of the divine mercy, they make their night sad, and stormy, and eternal? When Herod began to sink with the shameful torment of his bowels, and felt the grave open under him, he imprisoned the nobles of his kingdom, and commanded his sister that they should be a sacrifice to his departing ghost. This was an egress fit only for such persons who meant to dwell with devils to eternal ages, and that man is hugely in love with sin, who cannot forbear in the week of the assizes, and when himself stood at the bar of scrutiny and prepared for his final, never-to-be-reversed sentence. He dies suddenly, to the worst sense, and the event of sudden death who so manages his sickness that even that state shall not be innocent, but that he is surprised in the guilt of a new account. It is a sign of a reprobate spirit, and an habitual prevailing ruling sin, which exacts obedience when the judgment looks him in the face. At least go to God with the innocence and fair deportment of thy person in the last scene of thy life, that when thy soul breaks into the state of separation, it may carry the relishes of religion and sobriety to the places of its abode and sentence. When these things are taken care of, let the sick man so order his affairs that he have but very little conversation with the world, but wholly, as he can, attend to religion, and antedate his conversation in heaven, always having intercourse with God, 